we are live on yeah we are live yeah you will do no you will start off good evening delegates and all the participants thank you for joining this is sahiti on behalf of shield connect welcoming you all for today's webinar on pre gestational diabetes mellitus and pregnancy organized by safe motherhood committee oxy so let me welcome the moc of today's webinar dr shravya manohar uh, mam is currently the consultant at apollo women's hospital chennai and apollo heart center chennai clinical fellow at st george's university london fellowship in minimally invasive surgery mumbai and mam has received many number of awards including dr savitri subramanyam gold medal for best outgoing student and aicog best poster award I welcome you, ma'am, and I hand over the session to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Sahiti. I would first and foremost like uh, to, you know, welcome you all on behalf of Safe uh, the Safe Motherhood Committee. Yeah, I'm Dr. Shravya, and I will be taking you through today's program. Our topic today is pre-gestational diabetes mellitus and pregnancy. So, just to give you all a brief introduction of what this is. is pregestational diabetes mellitus is a newer term being used for diabetes mellitus both type 1 and type 2 occurring before the onset of pregnancy so diabetes mellitus nowadays affects nearly 77 million people above the age of 18 years and 25 million people are pre diabetic in india alone so pre existing glucose disorders are becoming more and more common in women trying to conceive This is what we would like to take you through today, through the help of our experts. So, before that, we would have the uh, Tamil Thai article followed by the virtual lighting of the Kuttavelaka. <laughs> now request our president oxy jerani kamraj ma'am to give the welcome address ma'am needs no introduction at all she is a senior consultant of reproductive medicine and okay, thank you shravya i'll get into the welcome address <laughs> so thank you thank you shravya so nice of you to have a good uh, starting with an moc with all the prayer and your lighting of the kutvalak i welcome one and all for this a uh, webinar on oxy safe motherhood committee on pre gestational diabetes mellitus and pregnancy a very special appreciation to the committee chairperson dr rajeshri with our team good team of this uh, safe motherhood committee all very dynamic young ogicians all a few welcome for this webinar i have the great pleasure and honor to welcome the senior faculties who are joined here and also the youngsters and the very dynamic young oxians dr harshmita Dr. Barani Vijay Raghavan, Dr. Deepthi Jami, 
welcome you all for this wonderful webinar and a very special welcome to the seniors dr preeti agarwal dr smita samal dr shrira mahadevan and dr meenakshi bajaj and also uh, our dear shravya and uh, rajeshri and a very special welcome to dr mg janlakshmi madam all are very dynamic and very uh, senior knowledgeable faculty is here we welcome you all on behalf of oxy 23 team and uh, nothing is possible without a good scientific content and it has been a very nice content we have here and i hope all the delegates who have joined here will be much benefited by this uh, webinar with their wonderful lectures and we welcome all the delegates and all the oxians and all the faculties and all over the country there are very many people who have logged in here thank you and welcome one and all over to shravya thank you ma'am thank you for the lovely introduction um next we have uh, rajashree ma'am doing the oxy prayer ma'am you you're muted thank you god in humility we gather in gratitude we pray for all the good things you've given us shower us with your blessings to pass on the healing touch to celebrate the arrival of each new life and a mom reborn the courage to deal with it all when things are not perfect and to remember that we are but messengers to keep our women safe and free from sorrow we bow before your kindness and magnanimity of your endless love thank you what is thank you so now we're moving on to the program of the day first we have a very interesting topic the topic being um role of hpa1c in pre gdm this is something that we're all looking to understand this is being presented by dr harish mitta anantakrishnan she is currently working as a senior resident at acs medical college and hospital chennai she did her education in sri ramachandra medical college and uh, she's done multiple poster presentations and has many allocates to her over to you dr harish mitta Dr. Harish Mitha, are you able to are you able to present your slides? Sahiti, is he there? No, ma'am. Okay. There was one doctor, no. Okay, then should we start with Barney? Is it okay, Barney? Is yeah. That... Okay. I'm okay, ma'am. So um. we'll start with the dr barney first she'll be doing newer insulins in pregnancy barney is one of my favorite colleagues that i've worked with um i've had the pleasure of working with her for quite some time now um she's a member of the safe motherhood committee she's now a senior resident at ramchandra medical college she did her gdo in uh, madras medical college and her dnb from apollo hospitals she's a gold medalist in her mbbs and came second in her dgo she's presented multiple um you know papers and she's been the recipient of the award for outstanding performance in maternal and child healthcare 2018 she got the best resident award in 2022 and best paper publication in 2003 from apollo hospitals over to you barney thank you ma'am uh a very good evening to one and all i am dr barani and i'll be talking about uh, newer insulins in pregnancy so we're talking about pre gestational diabetes and hypoglycemia in pregnancy and we're talking about women who are probably already on insulin when they have conceived laughter is the best medicine unless of course you're diabetic then insulin comes pretty high on the list it's been 100 years since best and banting this covered this miraculous drug which is insulin before that pregnant women were told that you have to undergo a termination of pregnancy or you might eventually die because you are diabetic and we don't have a cure for it but with the discovery of insulin the maternal mortality dropped by 63% within 30 years of its discovery so that fetched best in banting their nobel prize and it also got us the gold standard in the treatment of gdm and pre gestational diabetes we know that insulin is an effective easily adjustable and safe for the fetus 
So all the textbooks, all the societies have always traditionally recommended the usage of regular insulin and NPH, which is the intermediate act acting insulin for the control of sugars in pregnancy. But we have a lot of insulin analogs which were discovered much later, like the short acting ones like Lispro, Aspart, Glulysine, and the longer acting ones like Detimer and Deglutin. Where do we stand on their usage during pregnancy? That's what we're going to see. Before that, a small introduction on what we do, uh, how we give insulin during pregnancy. We divide the daily dose into two thirds in the morning and one third at night. And the morning dose is further divided into two thirds of intermediate acting and one third of short acting. And the pre-dinner dose is divided as half and half of intermediate and short acting. And we might have to add a lunchtime dose of rapid acting insulin if there's a postprandial hyperglycemia following lunch. And the insulin requirement increases as the pregnancy advances and in women who are obese. Now, these insulin analogs, uh, like the short, rapid acting ones like Aspart, Lispro, and Blue Lighting, the advantage they offer over regular insulin is that they bring about a state which is very close to a non diabetic or a normal state. And the chance of hypoglycemia is much lower and it's much more convenient to get these injections administered. Similarly, the long-acting insulin analogs, they maintain that they are more predictable and reproducible in their action of delivering a peakless low insulin level lasting for even 24 hours. So that's why these insulins are being preferred nowadays for women who have diabetes mellitus before they become pregnant. But what happens when you become pregnant? How do you decide what type of insulin we need to use? So basically, insulin pre preparations, when they have a low antigenicity, they are transferred across the placenta to a minimal level. The antibodies are transferred across the placenta to a minimal level. And regular insulin has been identified as the least immunogenic of the lot. But further studies nowadays say that rapid-acting insulin analogs like Lispro, Aspart, Blue Lysine also have comparable immunogenicity. So they can also be safely used like regular insulin. Now, there were a few myths when these drugs were introduced. One is if a woman who's type 1 diabetic and she's taking Lispro, it tends to lower the HbA1c quite rapidly in the first trimester. So they said it accentuated the chance of her getting diabetic retinopathy and because uh, Lispro is homologous to the insulin-like growth factor 1. But we have innumerable studies which have said that there's no progress of retinopathy from baseline after the use of Lispro in women with type 1 diabetes. Similarly, another concern was that there is a placental transfer of Lispro leading to macrosomia in the baby, but that myth is also busted because Lispro was not even detected when they sampled it, sampled for it in the cord blood. So Lispro and Aspat have been extensively investigated and they've been shown to be acceptable with a good safety profile Minimal, minimal transfer across the placenta with no evidence of teratogenesis. The neonatal outcomes are also similar and there is a low risk of postprandial hyperglycemia, delayed postprandial hyperglycemia and the postprandial excursions of blood sugar is also much less when compared with regular insulin. So unanimously, almost all the guidelines now are saying that Lispro and Aspart, the rapid acting insulin analogs can be used the RCOG says it does not show any adverse effect on the pregnancy or the health of the baby. The ACOG in its practice bulletin also says these are preferred over regular insulin due to their more rapid onset. And the FIGO also has considered it safe and effective for treatment during pregnancy. What about the government of India and the FOXI? As of now, they are recommending this premix insulin, which is a 30 to 70 ratio of regular insulin and NPH. But we had a study conducted in many parts of India, which said, which compared the premixed insulin with aspart versus premixed insulin with regular insulin in the same 30 to 70 ratio. And they said there was no statistically significant difference in the glycemic control. And people who received this aspart required lower daily dose than those who received uh, premixed insulin with regular insulin. They were both well tolerated. There was no hypoglycemia, similar neonatal outcomes. But the good thing was pregnant women found it more convenient to take the bias preparation because it allowed some flexibility due to, during the meal time and did not disturb their routine life pattern. So maybe even the government of India and the um, uh, Foxy might start recommending uh, taking Lispro and Aspart during pregnancy. It's close uh, relative to glue lysine. There have been 303 pregnancy exposures which have been studied 
uh, in the uh, post-marketing um, surveillance of this drug. And available evidence as of today does not suggest any causal association between the usage of blue lysine and increased risk of pregnancy complications. But at present, it is classified as pregnancy category C by the FDA. But we are moving into a new era of insulin technology. And we may be dealing with patients where there is no enough human data, particularly pertaining to pregnancy, we may not have enough human data. So we may it may be prudent to keep patients who have a good control of their sugar on their current insulin, even if that means they are on insulin analogs. And if at all they have a poorly controlled blood glucose and you're using pregnancy as the opportunity to start an insulin regimen, we may resort to using uh, insulins which have a known safety outcomes in pregnancy. Now coming to the long acting insulin analogs, they've not been very extensively studied in pregnancy, but whatever available data we have, both suggest that detima and glargin they are both safe and effective for use in pregnancy. Detimer is preferred usually because it just has a twice daily dose and it has a more consistent absorption. And the US FDA as early as 2012 classified it under category B. Now, a lot of post-marketing surveillance was done. This evolved study published in 2020 uh, consisted of sites predominantly in Europe and they said there were no major congenital malformations, perinatal or neonatal death following the use of Detimer. Similarly, when Detimer was compared with NPH, this was a study published in 2021 in AJOG, they said maternal outcomes like hypoglycemia, hypertensive disorders, weight gain, cesarean delivery, and postpartum complications, as well as fetal outcomes like shoulder dystocia, matrosomia, and ICU admission and respiratory distress, they were all much lower when the woman was treated with Detimer as a pair compared to NPH. And this was another study which was published in the DMJ in 2022, which said that Detimer could control blood glucose much faster. So the number of insulin injections that you require to control the blood glucose keeps getting reduced without affecting the mother or the baby. So it could be considered as an ideal basal insulin in clinical settings. With regards to glargin, uh, there was a concern that glargin at higher concentrations was probably crossing the placenta and causing issues in the baby. But it is now found that glargin does not cross the placenta when it is used in therapeutic concentration. So even at the concentration of 100 units per ml, as well as 300 units per ml, there were the rates of congenital anomalies and spontaneous miscarriages were same as the general population. So if a woman has been taking it prior to conception and has achieved a good glycemic control with it, it can be safely continued during pregnancy. With regards to Degludec, again, you don't have too many randomized controlled trials. There was one published by The Lancet earlier this year in February, which said that uh, Degludec offers good glycemic control. There's a once daily dosage, so the acceptance by the patient is much better. Uh, there were no hypoglycemic episodes noted, no congenital anomalies. So at this point in time, it has an off-label use during pregnancy. What are the guidelines saying about the long-acting analogs? RCOG still says isoprene insulin is the first choice for insulin during pregnancy, but you can consider continuing treatment with analogs like Detimer and Glargin in women who are pre-diabetic and have already been started on these before pregnancy. But of course, this still remains an off-label use according to the NICE guidelines. But RCOG says NPH insulin is still used, but Glargin and Detima uh, are safe. Sorry, this ACOG says this. And FIGO has included Detima in its uh, safe and effective treatment protocol, has not included uh, uh, Glargin yet, but Detima is considered safe. A quick word on insulin delivery systems. Now, we know that pregnancy physiology necessitates frequent titration of insulin because the blood sugar level is going to be fluctuating constantly. So we need to monitor the levels daily and we need to ins administer insulin according to the fluctuations. So as of today, multiple daily injections using insulin pens are preferred in most cases. But with the insulin pumps coming into vogue and a lot of these people being pre-diabetic, they've already started using insulin pumps and they're probably already very comfortable using these pumps, they may want to continue it into pregnancy. So what this pump does, most often we use automated uh, insulin delivery system where there is a closed loop control. So there is a, uh, the blood glucose is measured by a device and the sensor sends the message to the pump. 
there is a glucose control algorithm which gets activated and the dose of insulin that needs to be administered is uh, you know uh, calculated and the insulin pump injects this dose through a cannula into the person to control the blood sugar level so this is how the insulin delivery system works at this point in time the us fda does not use uh, does not recommend the use of any of the hybrid closed loop system which is in practice but maybe in the future it may start recommending. So basically the takeaways from my talk is at this point in time, Lisbro and Aspat are considered absolutely safe in pregnancy and recommended by most of the societies. And if the patient is on Detimer or Glargin and has had achieved a good glycemic control, she may be continued on them throughout her pregnancy. The usefulness of insulin pumps, of course, yet to be studied. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Barney, for this wonderful talk. It really put things into perspective and helped us out here. Thank you. Um, now, I think we'll have Dr. Harish Mitha do her talk, please. Are you able to connect now, Dr. Harish Mitha? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good evening. At the offset, I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. Beginning with my uh, presentation, in addition to the role of HbA1c in an over-diabetic, I would also like to... Uh, you haven't shared your slides. We're not able to see it. Uh, I just... Uh, is it yeah. seen now? You can put it on slide share, please. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Better, ma'am? Okay. In addition to the role of HbA1c, I'd like to So first is self-monitoring of blood glucose, which is a cornerstone in maintaining uh, euglycemia in a diabetic, both GDM as well as an over-diabetic. So self-monitoring of blood glucose, in uh, it begins, the cornerstone in self-monitoring is basically patient knowledge, patient's education regarding the need for maintaining euglycemia and the possible complications. An international working group in 2008, when they surveyed 13 countries, it was noted that India had the lowest rate of uh, lowest rate of usage of self-monitoring of blood glucose at about 0.2 percent. So structured uh, structured self-monitoring of blood glucose is wherein the patient will monitor the uh, blood glucose at specified intervals. In addition, they will also track their nutritional intake and physical activity. This will bring about a patient participation in maintaining euglycemia. And also they will be aware of their, uh, aware of the nutritional changes that can be made. And uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India recommends maintaining fasting less than 95 mg per deciliter and two hour postprandial at about 120 mg per deciliter. These are again advocated by the American, um, American Diabetes Association. So the NICE uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and American Diabetes Association, all of them um, advocate usage of self-monitoring of blood glucose as first line in monitoring of a diabetic pregnancy. In India, uh, we have a uh, uh, in India, the newer set of guidelines uh, recommends at two levels and recommended uh, care of a uh, recommended line of care and a limited in a limited resource setting. What can be done? These are again in uh, these are again in correspondence with the ACOG guidelines, wherein fasting as well as three post meal values every day are recommended in an over diabetic with above mentioned cutoff. So uh, in patients who are having recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia or fail to achieve euglycemia despite adequate insulin therapy, we started looking out an or alternate, alternate mode of monitoring in addition to the self-monitoring because self-monitoring was fraught with anxiety for a uh, pregnant women need for pricking repeatedly. This is when we got into the line of continuous glucose monitoring. This is basically a subcutaneous disposable system is inserted through the anterior abdominal wall, and this will uh, this has a uh, sensor which is uh, which is tasted with glucose oxidase, which will help in main, uh, help in assessing the interstitial fluid glucose level. This
this is done at about five seconds interval and at every 10 minutes it will uh, tabulate the value so uh, you can either have a masked uh, continuous glucose monitoring system or a real time glucose monitoring system in either of them the values are monitored at about uh, 5 minutes or at about 15 minutes interval giving a total of about 288 values per day in case of the mass the values are uh, values can be uh, can be retrieved when we are when the patient uh, presents to a physician and her endocrinologist Whereas in case of a real time, it will give sensors when uh, it will give out sensor sensors and alarms when the patient reaches hypoglycemic status, which gives an added advantage. So this continuous glucose monitoring was implemented in pregnant women for the first time in 2008. In this study, they uh, they compared. It was an RCT which employed over 600 women with type 1 diabetes, of which uh, 50 women were recruited in the continuous glucose monitoring group in addition to the uh, um, self-monitoring of blood glucose. And the other control arm had only um, routine antenatal care. It was noted that with continuous glucose monitoring, the HbA1c levels progressively dropped uh, by 0.5 at the end of 28 weeks and further to less than 5.8% by 32 weeks in comparison to the control group, which did not show any decline in HbA1c levels. So this led to the uh, uh, this led to a multicentric international randomized control trial in the same regard, which was carried across 13 countries. In this trial, uh, they had two sets of patients, one set of type 1 diabetic who were aiming for pregnancy and the second set of patients who were pregnant, type 1 diabetics who were pregnant. Again, they were divided into two wings, one wing containing comp the uh, comprising of continuous glucose monitoring with self-glucose monitoring and the other wing receiving routine antenatal care. Here, in addition to the HbA1c level, they also monitored the time interval for which they were able to maintain the normal blood glucose levels at a range of 3.8 to 7 millimoles. And it was um, this random this values were tabulated at, at the end of 24 weeks in case of a non-pregnant women and at, at the end of 34 weeks of gestation during pregnancy. It was noted that with continuous glucose monitoring, the patients were able to able to um, maintain the HbA1c less than 6.5 and also the glucose level within the euglycemic range for longer periods with continuous glucose monitoring continuous glucose monitoring and additionally in the pregnant women it was found that at the end of pregnancy these infants require uh, required lesser number of nicu admissions lower rates of uh, neonatal hypoglycemia needing intravenous dex intravenous dextrose but the biggest disadvantage and the limiting factor was the cost involved which was about 50 dollars for each uh, uh, continuous glucose monitoring system and additionally when the continuous glucose monitoring system was introduced uh, introduced for the first time to a pregnant woman, it uh, resulted in an increased anxiety when she was uh, continuously given her glucose, uh, her blood sugar values and reminded of her episodes of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Whereas when these patients were exposed to continuous glucose monitoring in the pre-pregnancy period and followed up during pregnancy, this complaint was to a lesser extent. So moving into my topic per se, uh, glyc glycated hemoglobin. Glycation of hemoglobin occurs throughout the uh, lifespan of the RBC of about 120 days. And this reaction rate depends upon the ambient blood glucose level. Ambient blood glucose level. And uh, here, basically, there is a non-enzymatic uh, linkage of glucose to the N-amino, uh, to the amino terminal valine of beta, uh, beta hemoglobin. And this accounts for about 5% of the hemoglobin. So in a normal pregnancy, it will... Uh, so in normal pregnancy, due to the increased red cell turnover, this HbA1c value tends to be at a lower level than in a non-pregnant state. And it will represent the glycemic control over the last 90 days. 90 days. So in the initial era, this HbA1c was highlighted as a marker, uh, marker of the glycemic control in the periconception period, particularly before seven weeks of uh, before seven weeks of gestation, the period of organogenesis. It was this study in 1982 which highlighted that uncontrolled sugars were the key cause for teratogenesis and increased the risk of cardiovascular as well as CNS abnormalities. So for the next 20 years, it was the, the use of HB1C was limited to 
uh, limited as a marker for periconceptional glycemic control and for um, and for assessing the uh, risk of risk of congenital anomalies in this study they noted that when the hba1c level was less than 8.5% the risk of uh, congenital malformations was around 3% in contrast to 22% when the risk uh, when the hba1c exceeded 8.5%. So for the next 20 years hba1c value values in type 1 diabetic was also limited to this uh, this uh, this path alone. It was in 2000, between 2003 and 2008 that we had the DAPIT study. The study's primary uh, aim was actually to assess the use of vitamin C as well as vitamin E in type 1 diabetics to prevent the occurrence of preeclampsia. Uh, but the secondary out, uh, as a secondary outcome, we tabulated the data which was collected, basically the HbA1c values and also the outcomes. And it showed that whenever the HbA1c val uh, values exceeded 6.5, there was a linear trend in large for gestation in age infants, incidence of preeclampsia, neonatal hypoglycemia, neonatal hypoglycemia and composite adverse outcomes such as shoulder dystocia, stillbirth, and all these outcomes were even seen at the range of 6 to 6.5 between 26 to 36, uh, 34 weeks. All the more at 26 weeks when the values exceeded 6.5, the risk of preterm deliveries was around 20 fold increased. So this is when we started highlighting the need for monitoring of HbA1c even during the second and third trimester, at least as a marker for identifying women at risk of adverse outcomes and managing accordingly. So this led to a plethora of studies which came over the next ten uh, next ten decades. This is the um, most recent study conducted in 2022, which is a retrospective analysis of over. Uh, 700 patients in Norway with type 1 diabetes whose HbA1cs were ta tabulated in the first trimester and in the third trimester. It was seen that when the third trimester HbA1cs exceeded 6.5, the incidence of large for gestation age babies prematurity and need for cesarean section was all increased. And when when either a large for gestation in age baby, uh, large for gestation in age prematurity, cesarean section, preeclampsia, when one either one of these outcomes were taken as criteria. It was seen that 81% of the type 1 diabetic patients exceeding 6.5% 6 HbA1c had one of these adverse outcomes. Furthermore, 25% of these patients also had uh, diabetic retinopathy, new onset or progression. progression. And uh, this was, but the biggest disadvantage was it was a retrospective study. And, and, uh, uh, supporting these findings were the next study wherein uh, wherein they again it was a retrospective study here they tried assessing the uh, assessing the uh, predictive value of HbA1c as a marker for large for gestation in age babies when it was used along with any of the growth charts that is your uh, Hadlock's growth chart or the national um, National Institute of Child and Health Development growth chart all of their predictive values increased increased two folds in when HbA1c was in, included along with the ultrasound biometry markers. So uh, concluding, my uh, concluding my talk, there have been various uh, smaller studies which again have implicated the same results that HbA1c when elevated in the second and the third, uh, late second and the third trimester are marker for preeclampsia, large for gestation and age infants, preterm delivery, highlighting the necessity for monitoring of HbA1c at each trimester and the aim of uh, monitoring would be to maintain the HbA1c at less than 6% without without any hypoglycemic episodes and it it may be relaxed to 7% if there are recurrent hypoglycemic episodes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harishmita. That was really um, an eye-opening uh, talk. Thank you for it. Next, we have uh, Dr. Can we take this off? Sahiti, can we have the next slide? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Arishmita, you have ma'am. Yeah. So next, we have uh, Dr. Deepti Jami. Uh, Deepti ma'am is someone who's very, very dear to me. And um, I can't think of anyone who can take us through this topic than someone who has such passion for this topic, to be honest. Um, so she's a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in fetal medicine. 
um, fellowship advanced obzin gyni ultrasound and meri scan she did both her undergrad and postgrad at uh, shri ramchandra medical college she's a recipe uh, she's a director in fetal medicine consultant at jami uh, scans an adjunct fa faculty at savita medical college she's won a number of um, you know gold medals and she has many medals and awards um, to her credit and hand it over to you dr dikti thank you so much shavya it's nice to see you online too let me just share my screen just one second at the onset um, thank you so much ashima for giving me the opportunity and it's a pleasure to be a part of safe motherhood committee oxy because we learn a lot we study a lot we research a lot and every month thursdays uh, we do wait to enhance our knowledge so i'm glad i'm here and can you see my screen shavya and yeah okay thank you we just have to slide the show yeah i'll just start it okay so um i think over the next uh, 15 minutes uh, the prior two speakers have actually laid the foundation quite strong enough and uh, for me uh, from this stage onwards uh, i think it's going to be a little easy but then uh, what i have found uh, initially in most of my talks that's how i handle a difficult topic and the topics which was given to me was pre gestational diabetes um and during pregnancy how to handle so the first thing when we think about within 15 minutes the first 10 questions which came to my mind um uh, were the first thing why it all ultrasound uh, we know for many facts that it is a no brainer that we know that the diabetic mothers need ultrasound but uh, does incidence of significance is so high that everyone has to have a particular level 2 ultrasound being done why at all do we need to do that two as we all know yes fetal anomalies are high but what do we know why why is it high so what happens inside the fetal menu or maternal menu when it, there is hypoglycemia and what causes uh, uh, what causes these fetal anomalies to occur in a diabetic mother and when we do a level 2 scanning or even level 3 scanning what are the organ systems mainly do we concentrate to find out anomalies fourth question is fetal echo does it is it mandatory for all diabetic mothers and the, there are studies if when we went into literature we could able to, we were able to find out whether the fetal ultrasound can actually give you some lead to start on pharmacological therapy then again what do we have in guidelines for fetal well being how to monitor these fetuses and apart from growth scans when we do are always the fetal weight when we give a third trimester ultrasound is same as that of the birth weight does that make any difference in a pre diabetic pre gestational diabetic mother and if not just for the estimated fetal weight are there any other ultrasound markers which they have uh, predicted or they have tried studying for macrosomia to prevent obstetric uh, tear or pph or a traumatic pph or shoulder dystocia for the baby or even a brachial break, plexus injury the nightmare for every obstetrician is can we predict still birth in a pre gestational diabetic mother last but not the least after knowing all this in the next 15 minutes the last one minute we are going to just see whether we can actually stratify these diabetic mothers when they walk into our op the next time when we sit in our op to see them so i think uh, quickly going through the next 15 minutes given to me rachi ma'am has given me 5 minutes extra so i'll be taking you through these points so the first point why at all ultrasound in pre diabetic mothers obviously for no other known facts that the ultrasound is the only methodology which we have right now to identify congenital anomalies it's not about only anomalies we are also talking about fetal growth here and in a pre gestational diabetic mother we are also talking about growth restriction it's not always macrosomia and if the mother is going to have a vasculopathy associated with diabetic uncontrolled diabetes even before prior to her entering into pregnancy then we are worried about fetal growth restriction as well so it's either deviant from the normal fetal growth pattern at then appropriate timing of ultrasound will give us or allow us the option to give the patient a timely intervention for termination and also the proper estimated fetal weight so that we can time delivery accordingly not only about that pre gestational diabetes we all know that when we compare pre gdm mothers to gdm mothers we know that the incidence is 3 to 4 times high that's quite high a number 
And overall, you know, almost 10% of diabetic population are there in our country. And definitely it depends on the degree of severity of your diabetic control prior to pregnancy. And when you see into the perinatal deaths, it's close to 50% of infants when they die because of congenital malformations. So are, aren't these points good enough for us to say that a pre-gestational -di pre diabetic mother should definitely have a level two or if possible, a two or a level three ultrasound to make sure that the congenital anomalies are ruled out. Then second one, why fetal anomalies with diabetic mothers? We all know they are at increased risk of fetal anomalies, but what happens inside which causes these fetal anomalies is what we need to identify. So there were few theories which were proposed, which probably were reason for a fetal organogenesis at that time. So starting from the early trimester onwards, when there is a mother, a pregnant mother with uh, uncontrolled diabetes, uh, poor glycemic control prior to even pregnancy or during the early centers, it, it ends up with spontaneous miscarriages. Second, a hyperglycemic mother in the first trimester is a nightmare for all the obstetricians and the fetal medicine consultant where the fetal organogenesis develop. So you probably could end up with a hyperglycemic embryo which could prepose or predispose for a fetal embryopathy. And apart from maternal hyperglycemia, which also increases hyperinsulinemia in the second and third trimesters will promote into fetal macrosomia. So no matter what gestation, no matter whether the preconception, because uh, research says that 50% of pregnancies are unplanned pregnancies in a pre-gestated diabetic mother. So even though they know, whether they know they are already diabetic or they are alarmed or they are shot at the first visit, in the booking visit, you identify your maternal sugar as high as 300 or 350 is when most of the pregnancies are unplanned. So it's extremely important for, for us to stress on proper lifestyle management. I think we'll be discussing all that in our upcoming panel discussion. Yes, glucose control and malformations do uh, play a major role and we can even correlate with hp on c as my prior speaker has mentioned so then what what do the what do these cause and effect on so the first thing we know they do cause fetal anomalies or birth defects then how does it exactly correlate one during pregnancy obviously we know that the insulin resistance is there when there is a hyperglycemic status it's a sweet period during pregnancy so what happens is that Basically, all these, I know the slide is a little cluttered, but all what we have to understand is that there is a good level of oxidative stress going on. There is a release of nitrous oxide, free radicals, and all these with the cellular signaling transition going wrong with dysregulation of genes, you are going to end up either with the transcriptional changes or with the epigenetics involvement or with oxidative stress, you are going to end up with fetal defects. So these are the epigenetic changes which could happen in a hyperglycemic mother which could also be translated to a hyperglycemic embryo. So having known that all these signaling pathways can go wrong, then what are we looking at? Are we looking at only to the point where we are actually seeing only the fetus? No. Apart from the fetus, what you can see here, starting from miscarriage in the early onset with the fetal anomalies, neural tube defects, and even stillbirths, we're also looking at a significant level of childhood, adolescent, and uh, neurological diseases as they grow. So then what are we all, what are the organ systems that we usually look into when we scan a patient who is having a pre-gestational diabetes? So the first thing we all know, it's definitely multi-system involvement, no doubt at all. Obviously, when the result is as early as in the first trimester or in the early pregnancy where fetal organogenesis happen, it hits the cephalic neural crest cells, also the mesodermal involvement. So obviously, there is free radical uh, exposure with apoptosis. And two main systems which we are concerned are the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord anomaly, and the cardiac system. These two are the main systems we generally concentrate not apart from the rest, obviously we do a detailed anomaly scan along with echo, but then up beyond this is two main systems that we concentrate on an anomaly scan. Name it all the anomalies. I can't think of any other anomaly being left out apart from neural tube defects, anum cephaly, starting from anum cephaly, holoprosum cephaly, NTDs, cardiac anomalies with septal defect, AVSDs, coaptation of iota, Truncus or mainly the outflow tract abnormalities. And apart from the cardiac defects, you also have genitourinary abnormalities. And not just genitourinary abnormalities as in hydronephrosis or ectopic kidneys, but at the same time, you also have anorectal anomalies. So name the system from head to toe, your diabetic mother who's uncontrolled is going to have an issue with the pregnancy.
Apart from this, in during when we consider it by each by system in CVS, what are we looking at? Mainly, it's going to be transposition of gate vessels, and uh, apart from BSDs and conotruncal anomalies. And why do we concentrate on this? Because if you can see here, a diabetic mother has three to four fold times higher risk when compared to a mother where her glycemic status is absolutely under control. So it's extremely crucial that we concentrate on the cardiac anomaly or, or cardiac issues part. Apart from that, we are also going to deal with, I'm also going to give you how we are going to deal with cardiomyopathy and what are the things that we can actually see during a growth scan if we can, uh, if we can predict a fetal cardiomyopathy and wide good range of cardiac anomalies can also happen postnatally for an infant with a diabetic mother. Beyond cardiac anomaly, as I said, next one is caudal regression syndrome with spine and neural tube defects in their central nervous system. Beyond this, apart from limb abnormalities, we do have cleft lip and palate, hydronephrosis, and also we have certain structures which we will not be able to appreciate strongly during an anomaly scan, even during an anolectal atresia or a duodenal atresia. Uh, we have many, umpty number of times we have encountered single umbilical artery with diabetic mothers, no doubt at all. Glycemic threshold. My previous speaker was extremely good in talking about HbA1c and the importance which she has already stressed upon. We all know the more the value and that was specifically when we see above 7.5 or 8, our antennas are really, really up. You can see us when the 8 mark is crossed, you can see a, a spike about where you can actually see the major risk of major abnormalities. Beyond this, what else an HbA1c can predict in a pre-gestational diabetic mother is that your normal HbA1c cutoff of probably by 7 to 7.5 could definitely pose at higher risk of anomaly fetus. But then when it goes beyond 8.5 or 9 is when it's very crucial that you need to talk about when you need to think about an early anomaly scan at this stage. But many other things also they saw in the study where they mentioned that either the NT value, nasal bone, ductus venosus did not have a significant impact on anomalous fetus, neither they had an impact or they were able to predict your stillbirth history. So it's very important that a normal NT scan does not rule out anything for your diabetic mother. Yes, it does rule out chromosomal abnormalities and overall uh, uh, structural evaluation, but definitely the mother needs to be brought to you back for an early target scan, if preferable by 18 to 19 weeks to rule out structures and again, have an echo if she's of high BMI. Okay, let me come to the main point. We all know that in spite of all these anomalies, we still, in spite of doing an excellent anom anomaly scan, a level two ultrasound, we will not be able to pick up these four major abnormalities which are pertaining to our pre-gestation diabetic mother. One is very, very small VSDs around three millimeter or so, two late onset cardiomyopathies, imperforate anus, a cleft palate without a cleft lip. So I think this uh, is extremely important because when we encounter babies of diabetic mothers, we need to be aware that there are anomalies which cannot be picked up even by a full-fledged targeted ultrasound. Then next, next question props up, do we need to do fetal echo for all mothers? Obviously, that's I'm not talking about the routine screening. For diabetic mothers, yes, there has been plenty, empty number of research articles which has said that it is a good practice point to follow a fetal echo. Oh, then next question will come. Then what do you see in a fetal echo? Then if you then the things which you don't see in anomaly scan, is it extra? Or do you see more things in a fetal echo? Yes, definitely, yes. But then Majority of the anomalies which I had mentioned uh, in the cardiac anomaly for a diabetic mother are covered in your anomaly scan itself. It's not that you need to sit and do a fetal echo to rule out the major structural anomaly. But what you need to do extra is just as I told you for a cardiomyopathy or an interventricular septal thickness. 70% of your major CHDs can be picked up in an anomaly scan. But then what happens when you screen a patient at 19, 20 weeks? Invariably, most of the maternal uh, or diabetic mothers are of high BMI. So your, your suboptimal uh, uh, visualization, the visual, uh, visualization of the organs of the fetal organs, say the spine or the even the uh, cardiac for that matter, might be a little difficult. And that's the reason why it is always a good practice to uh, do an early targeted scan at 19 weeks for a diabetic mother. And there is nothing wrong to get them back at 22 weeks for a detailed echo. And what happens 
why in an, even a, the reason what why we say that the diabetic mothers need a growth scan apart from growth along with growth also a cardiomyopathy assessment is that when we see the cardio uh, cardiac anatomy in a growth scan we can also see the interventricular septal thickness and these thickness can actually give you a probable likelihood ratio of whether this fetus would require would develop a cardiomyopathy later on or in a postnatal life so that could be a transient myocardial hypertrophy in these fetuses which could be asymptomatic post delivery the fetus might be absolutely normal and could transiently go uh, within 6 to 12 months but that's very important that we identify if we feel that the uh, eyeballing wise if we feel that the yes the cardiac is looking enlarged than what we generally see in a 32 34 week scan and it is a good practice that we have normal values for interventricular septal thickness measurement also then does ultrasound not only rule out anomaly does it also give you any weightage to start pharmacological therapy there has been articles for that as well obviously maternal markers are the first things that we assess before we start them on either medical management like metformin or obesity and the disease severity is what we take into consideration but an abdominal circumference as early as 28 to 32 weeks is one of the good criteria just some criteria and they actually did a research which said when your abdominal circumference is more than the 75th centile and your fasting blood pressure maternal blood sugar is more than 105 and they compared they segregated these two patients the patients who are just with diet alone versus being insulin given insulin they found that with diet alone, the LGA babies were 45%. When they treated with 13%, the insulin baby, uh, insulin treated mothers, the LGA babies were 13%. I'm not coming to say that you have to treat all your mother, all your mothers with insulin. That's not what we not that's not what they tried to prove in. But they what they said that when you include this as one of the markers, probability your accuracy might be a little high. So when you're fasting is between 105 to 120 along with the fetal AC beyond 75 to 80 centile, it was definitely a good predictor of an LGA baby. Um, then the next question comes that whether it's a single AC measurement or serial AC measurements. A single AC measurement definitely has less sensitivity or specificity when compared to serial AC measurements because when we compare a growth chart, always growth is compared. And when we compare the growth chart, say the baby which was growing exactly at around 30th or 35th centile in your anomaly scan, and it peaks to 75th or 80th centile in your 29 weeks, and it goes to 95th centile at 36 weeks, there you go, you know that's an LGA baby. Obviously, a single AC marker is not going to predict an LGA or a macroscopic baby. It has to be a serial growth chart. Last few questions. Then what happens when you need to monitor you have brought her under control either through medications or medical management or through insulin then how will you monitor then when is the growth scan next this is another doubt when we have then this is the latest guidelines or the most of one of the guidelines which we saw was nice guidelines which was amended in 2015 is that yes definitely an ultrasound at 20 weeks no doubt with four chamber and outflow tracks views along with three vessel view apart from that every four week monitoring but beyond 28 weeks but what we do probably at around 28 to 30 weeks one growth scan and if it's normal closer to delivery that's around 35 to 36 is what we are seeing based on the maternal glycemic control so obviously it's going to be individualized but the recommendation is every four weekly monitoring beyond 28 29 weeks and also they said that routine dopplers are not required you don't have to do a fetal umbilical artery routinely but then of course when you do a growth graph you are, when you document a fetal heart rate definitely you can go ahead for an umbilical artery doppler monitoring and obviously it's going to be an individualized approach and this cannot be taken as a protocol for all diabetic mothers finally let me come to the point that ultrasound estimated fetal weight is it same as your birth weight is it always and specifically is it for what happens to for a diabetic mother so generally in a conventional biometry when we measure when we take hc ac and fl in an experienced operator hands minimum measurement of error or sub subjective error is will be around 10 percent but where in the where between 10 to 20 percent error is what the uh, literature says when you compare the birth weight of the baby to that of the estimated fetal weight Whereas, if you will be alarmed to know that in type 1 diabetic mothers, your, you can go up to 900 grams. So, when we talk about percentages, at least to me, when we talk about percentages, the alarm is not that high. But let me give you an example. 
you are saying the fetus is weighing four kgs at birth. My estimated fetal weight by my growth scan and ultrasound can be as low as a 3.1 kg for the same baby versus another graph which could another scan could also give me 4.9 kg baby. So here what I'm trying to say is the baby would weigh only 4, 4 kgs but then my scan can report as either a 3.1 kg or even a 4.9 kg. So that means there's an error of up to 900 grams which is huge and apart from that there is also a 14 day interval study which they have done. So if say for example, I'm doing a scan on April 1st and the baby is getting delivered on April 14 or April 15, diabetic babies, they almost gain close to 50 grams per day. And that could also be one of the mark, one of the reasons why there could be such a gross difference between the estimated fetal weight and ultrasound versus them. And the reason why there is, that could be such a gross difference is because of the thickness of the subcutaneous fat. The subcutaneous fat thickness, which might not be that evident in your AC or HC or FL sections, can be a pointer why that could be, not always, but there could be sometimes error between the estimated fetal weight and scan. So in the last few questions, let me see, then I said subcutaneous fat, then my estimated fetal weight uh, is going to be 20% error. Then are there any markers in ultrasound which could actually predict macrosomia? So many, they had umpteen number of markers which they had actually seen. They had seen cheek to cheek diameter, they have seen humerus soft tissue measurement, which was more than 13 millimeter at term. And they have even measured the fetal liver length beyond 18 weeks. They had developed ratios between skin thickness and FL interventricular septum and AC things, but all these measurements, they were not being able to reproduce it well. Why they were not being able to reproduce? Because there's plenty of inter-observer variation. Why is that? Because when you have a marker, say your fetal head, it's a bony prominence, right? From, you can say outer to inner, and if there are five doctors measuring it, more or less, all of us will have maximum one to two millimeter difference. But when you take AC measurement, we ourselves take two to three AC measurements to get the mean value. The reason why is that AC is a soft tissue with a subcutaneous fat. So even if you say outer to outer measurement, there could be empty number of inter-observer inter variation when we measure abdominal circumference. And that is the reason why none of these markers gain popularity in spite of them studying so much to identify a macrosomic baby where you could prevent a shoulder dystocia. Then last, nightmare for all of us. Why does stillbirth happen? And the main reason is thrombosis of fetal veins, probably sometimes a cardiomyopathy, alteration in the placental villi architecture. But can your umbilical artery, MCA artery, can predict the stillbirth? Unfortunately, no. But then there is an article which was published in 2016 or so, which studied ductus venosus and a fetal hepatic artery. But still, the group of patients were very limited and they said, we need more numbers to prove that. So as of now, there is no modality by which we can actually predict the onset of stillbirth in a diabetic mother. Then last but not the least, having said that all these things about um, the fetal anomalies, the growth, the deviation from growth, I would only like to stress upon the preconception period because we don't have any other period other than that to actually uh, tell these couple that this is extremely crucial. Remember that there are anomalies, mainly cardiovascular and CNS. Three, Apart from the unplanned pregnancies, if you catch them early in the booking visit, try to get them get their glycemic control as soon as possible. Definitely uh, an early target scan followed by fetal echo is of much more importance than a routine anomaly scan. To conclude, is it okay to stratify diabetic mothers? Can we do it in our booking visit? Probably I've tried to give few things here. The first bucket, the red bucket, alarming people are the pre-gestation diabetic mothers. The second bucket, Probably okay bucket is there where they are gestational diabetes, but they are of high BMI. But the third bucket would be, yes, they are GDM mothers, but they do not have a pre-diabetic markers. So all I would like to stress upon, yes, as a fetal medicine person, my preconception role makes huge difference in malformations, congenital anomalies, fetal anomalies, in spite of our bestest efforts, there are a few anomalies which might not be even picked up. They are occult anomalies, especially anorectal anomalies. Macrosomic and stillbirth, we do try our level best to give you the exact accurate weight as possible. But because of the subcutaneous tissue fat or the fetal growth, accelerated fetal growth at the later gestation might 
not exactly correlate with the fetal weight when we give for a diabetic mother versus a low risk pregnancy. So um, I hope I was able to clarify a few practical points uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you once again, Rashri ma'am and Jairani ma'am for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepthi ma'am, for that wonderful talk. I think it really not only put things in perspective, but also helped us understand from a practical point of view. So that will help us in our daily practice as well. Um, next, we go on to uh, the much-awaited panel discussion on pre-gestational diabetes mellitus in pregnancy. So first, I would like to introduce the moderators. I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Danlakshmi. Danlakshmi, ma'am, has been my professor through my UG PG days. Um, it's a great honor to be introducing her today. She's a professor and senior consultant, uh, OBGYN at Sri Ramchandra Medical College. And um, she's an executive committee member of Oxy 2023. And she's a very, very passionate undergrad and postgrad teacher. Next is Dr. Rajashree. Um, Ma'am is why I'm here today. Uh, she's, I, I can't thank her enough for letting me be part of the Safe Motherhood Committee. Um, she's a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. And um, she is part of the Sri Swastya Clinic Center for Women and Children, executive committee member of OXI. She's the chair and head of the Safe Motherhood Committee. Her area of special interest is high risk optics, and she's a contributor to the management of labor, third edition uh, for textbook for postgrads and practitioners. Next, coming to the panelists. Again, it's a great honor to be uh, introducing uh, Preet Ma'am today. She's been my mentor throughout my post-graduation. She's a professor and senior consultant at Sri Ramchandra Medical College, and she's an undergrad and post-graduation teacher since 2000. Next is someone, again, who's someone who's very dear to me, Dr. Sunita Samal. Um, no, she's a consultant at... Uh, an... Sabia, Sunita Madam had some emergency. She'll not be able to take part oh, in the panel. Okay. We ha next have with us Dr. Sri Ram Mahadevan. He is currently professor and head of uh, endocrinology, diabetes, and uh, metabolism at Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, Chennai. He's a consultant endocrinologist at SMF and has a private clinic at uh, Alvapet, uh, Chennai. He's published more than 90 papers and has been awarded honorary national professor by the Indian Medical Association. Formerly, he was the vice president and finance secretary of the Endocrinine Society of Tamil Nadu and Puducherry, and his special interests include thyroid, metabolic bone, and gonadal disorders and diabetes. We also have with us Dr. Binakshi Bajaj. She's a registered dietitian, author, and reviewer and columnist. Um, she works at the Tamil Nadu Government Multi -special, Super Specialty Hospital, Chennai. She's a former dietitian who worked at uh, Institute of Diabetology and Madras Medical College. She's a NEC member in Indian Dietitian, Dietics Association. And she she's been part of many, many uh, journals and has many, uh, you know, allocates to her name. We'll start the panel now, thank you. Saditi, we'll try uh, sharing through a different uh, system. If thank I am not me. able to, uh, I will ask you to share it. Sure, sure. Just try. Welcome, Dr. Sriram, Dr. Meenakshi. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Joey. So Good evening, sir. You loaded it somewhere, no? Ma'am is, as uh, Dana Ma'am is trying to share, we are dividing the panel into uh, pre-GDM into type 1 and type 2 for the sake of convenience. And then uh, Dana Madam will be doing first type 1 diabetes pre-gestational and uh, I'll follow with type 2 diabetes pre-gestational. 
Udana ma'am, I request you to please open the PPT ma'am. Okay. The can you share? Tahiti Dana, I'm asking you if you could share, please. Okay, ma'am. I'm not able to share it. Sure, sure. Thank you. Can you see the screen now? Dana, ma'am? I think her connectivity is... We are not able to see it. Yeah. She can switch yeah. off the video for better... Bandwidth. I think our connectivity is not good. Can you see now? Oh, okay, we can see now. We can see now. Can you hear us, sir? Can yes. you hear us? Yes, 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 yes we can. Uh, Sahiti, can you move to the next slide? See if you can. Uh, is... Let the song play our first slide. First slide. First slide. Okay, okay. Just want to try that. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, we'll be taking up a case of came to us about four months back. That time, Shivari, I mean, one uh, cesarean and one uh, abortion. And uh, while we were uh, contemplating to how to go about this pregnancy, uh, she came back for 11 weeks with a missed miscarriage. And uh, she was so uh, disgusted. She wanted to even go for a uh, sterilization along with suction evacuation. But we counseled her, next time we will uh, control your sugars well and we will take you along. Now that brings us to the question. Uh, next, uh, keep on asking. How do you want to carry out preconception counseling, uh, Dr. Preet? So she has come to us after uh, having lost a second pregnancy in succession. Uh, pre uh, preconceptional counseling is a very important uh, thing to be discussed with her, having lost the baby this time. And optimizing the glycemic control is a very important thing that already discussed by Dr. Harish Mitha and also Dr. Deepthi was also telling us. So, but most of the time they come to us when the first trimester, then when they do the UPT, uh, UPT test and come. Very rarely we get them to come for a preconceptual counseling. Here we have to tell them that look, the chances of the pregnancy going a little more expensive, more number of pricks for you, having a good euglycemic control throughout the whole pregnancy, apart from keeping the pre-pregnancy HPA1C to less than 6.5, and more of scans will be done and more of checkups will be done. At the same time, we also have to address her comorbidities if they are present or not. Whether she has got any diabetic retinopathy or any uh, or uh, nephropathy is there or not, we have to address them. And accordingly, we have to tell her that, uh, that accordingly, we have to counsel her and tell her the importance. Yeah, why? What is the importance of getting a good glucose level? Already, Arisha yeah, has brought yeah, it up. Yeah, ma'am. Everybody has been discussed because the congenital anomalies in the first trimester, if the HbA1c goes slowly higher, like it goes up to twenty percent, if it is more than HbA1c more than fourteen, and it goes up to twenty percent, if it is more, if it goes more, more than two to four times more chances of hitting the anomalies are there. So we should have a good glycemic control. And the CBG should be there less than 90 and 
Yes, you can go up to one less than one fifty five is okay. So remember, normal normal glycemia in pregnant ladies is there. Okay, is a in the patients without diabetes lower than in the non-pregnant slide. Next slide, Sajiti. Next slide, Sajiti. So, how do you want to address the comorbidities? The comorbidities, if we expect in a patient uh, with the uh, type of diabetes, are mainly these two: nephropathy and uh, retinopathy. So, do you think they are going to become uh, bothersome for the patients? Yes, definitely. In the poorly controlled hypertension, we be there if there is a diabetic nephropathy, reduced glomerular filtration, heavy protein urea will be there. And accordingly, will be iatrogenic induction of labor, which will lead to preterm delivery will be there. And in the long term, we can have the kidney damage and instead instead the kidney diseases can also occur. Uh, next slide, please. And even for the this one also retinopathy, there can be more problem. In case of retinopathy, there we should it can worsen. The, the reason for the nephropathy uh, retinopathy getting worsens. Is because of the we are giving a good glycemic control, rapid intensification. We are controlling the good normal because of the hormonal changes during pregnancy, and it is related to pregnancy vascular changes also. Uh, next slide, please keep uh, moving along with us, talking the side. Uh, you can skip this slide. We already finished this slide. So, do we generally look for hypothyroidism in these patients too? Is always uh, autoimmune, autoimmune thyroid, thyroiditis is associated. I think uh, sir will be able to answer. Sir, do you feel if TSH should be less than 2.5? Uh, because the current guideline set is uh, 4. Uh, but uh, what literature I think from the net uh, says that uh, TSH should be less than 2.5 for a type 1 diabetes. But as far as uh, thyroid function is concerned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much uh, to everybody. And this question, see, this is many things. I think uh, the listeners would have uh, gained a knowledge that we are repeating the same facts so that the drive home points on diabetes point of view, I fully agree, but there are a lot of practical issues. It's sometimes uh, easy to read out from a slide. The difficulty in a type 1 diabetes yes, we face, type 1 diabetes is extremely difficult to manage even in non-pregnant situation and pre-pregnancy counseling cannot be overemphasized and uh, all type 1 diabetics, there should be a thyroid screening every year, right from the diagnosis. So it is a almost 60% of, almost 60 to 80% will be autoimmune type 1, 20-30% could be this way, that way. So almost 60-70% will of them will have hypothyroidism. So, and if you are in North India or you have a North Indian origin patient, even celiac disease, so other autoimmune comorbidities should be always screened at. And we should tailor our uh, dietary and uh, nutritional uh, requirements as well as control, etc. Yes, like this, like this. So the TSH control in these are all exceptions. So they are all already known diabetics. Keep it within the range. Um, I was uh, listening to Dr. Deepthi's uh, that uh, ultrasound, one of the slides, she said, you know, 10 to 20% variation will be there in uh, the estimation of uh, amniotic fluid or something by each observer. Please remember each of the numbers, is, uh, whether it is HbA1c or glucose values, either in the lab or in the glucometer or TSH, everything has a variation. So don't go by a single number. And in this case, I agree that keep it on the lower side. She has had abortions. Uh, somewhere around 2.5 is the usual criteria given in high-risk people, in autoimmune people. So 2.5 will be the correct answer for an uh, academic uh, like this. But if it was 3.5, I will not immediately jump. Sorry to interrupt. If, if it is 3.5, I will not immediately jump and every time change. That also is practical point I want to mention. Thank you. But 2.5 is okay. 2.5 is okay. Uh -huh. So uh, when, you are when you're counseling the patients, uh, the complications that are identified in type 1 diabetes are slightly different from what we generally need. They are not the same as in uh, GDMs. 
So the one of the complications, uh, or I would say dreaded complications, hypo and hyperglycemia. So let us talk about uh, hypoglycemia. Two diabetes the reasons for uh, hypoglycemia. Now, now what happens when she is, uh, she knows she is pregnant. So she feels that the sugar should be very well controlled. So in that way, she will try to have a very good control of sugar by reducing the amount of food she is eating. Plus, we will tell in the first trimester, she will have a lot of vomiting, nausea and all that. So that can also lead to the hypoglycemia. Hormonal changes are there. And then what happens is now that she is not able to, the, in the first trimester, the mood swings will be there and she will not be able to eat the correct food, the correct food also. So hypoglycemia is more likely to occur in the patients with type 1 diabetes because of autoimmune destruction, also associated of the alpha cells, uh, alpha cells of the uh, pancreas that leads to production of, uh, reduction in production of the glucagon which usually compensates when the patient is uh, uh, in a hypoglycemic state. So, thus the reason for getting more of hypoglycemia in case of the pregnancy is there. Okay, of course, the symptoms of hypoglycemia will really vary depending on whether it's mild hypoglycemia, moderate or severe. But... Uh, Mild can be as simple as uh, just again and again. Uh, severe we can be hard patients who come with seizures and with low sugar. So you will have to be aware, especially when they are uh, sugars are showing below 60, you will have to really mark them as uh, severe hypoglycemia and uh, uh, treat them as an emergency. So how do you treat them? If you identify a patient, so of course you are going to want them. Okay, but it's going below 80 itself, you can want them. But however, once you, ma'am, you are not audible. They can switch off the video. Uh, patient with hypoglycemia. Sir, what we do, sir, I think sir will be a better uh, judge to answer. But whenever the patient is hypoglycemia, we can ask them to carry for in her pocket, like fruit juices, some biscuits. No, no, she's. I am. Am I audible now? Yeah, better, better, better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we have switched off the video, so that makes it simple for us also. So, Srinam, so sir, you can uh, you can tell us. Is there any better way of uh, identifying hypoglycemia and how to educate the patient about uh, warning symptoms? Yeah, in type one diabetes, uh, that is that is it's a very tricky thing. You see, any patient who has repeated hypoglycemia, even subclinical, the third, fourth episode or the tenth episode, will they will become unaware. What is called hypoglycemia, unaware. That's a very serious issue, especially in type yes. 1 diabetes. And in pregnancy, already there will be increased demand and they are more prone for that. And as you know, this is autoimmune. They could have associated uh, adrenal problem also. So this is a very complex thing. It's not as simple as answering in a one word or in an MCQ here. So at the end of the day, that is why all these monitoring, you know, this continuous glucose monitoring is of tremendous importance in this situation where asymptomatic hypoglycemia can be picked up. Symptomatic hypoglycemia, I fully agree. If the patient is fully aware, without awareness, the all obviously the sweating, palpitation, etc. And I fully agree with these slides. Standard thing, always carry. See, but uh, do not, uh, one practical tip is, you know, you, you have to carry something to eat. Uh, like, you know, the, the, especially now glucose tablets are available, which we always say four to five tablets, you immediately pop in. That will be equivalent to that 50 gram of, uh, 15 gram of glucose, which they are saying here. But follow it up with something solid. Do not just take that and immediately, you know, a, a sugary solution will last only for the next 15, 20 minutes. So something solid, which would be in the form of either that idli or biscuit or sandwich or something, etc. immediately. And review with you our primary doctor so that we can adjust the if there is a pattern, we can adjust the insulin accordingly. On any day, you know, preventing hypoglycemia is, frankly speaking, practically more important than the aggressive control of, uh, uh, you know, diabetes. We know that diabetes won't be too strictly controlled in every type 1. But preventing hypo at least will make her life better in pregnancy and she'll be much, you know, happier dealing with pregnancy and other issues. That's the way we look at it. I've never seen glucagon in my lifetime. But I know you would have had some experience with glucagon. Um, no, glucagon, glucagon, is, glucagon is available. Unfortunately, in India, 
uh, the temperature already they are carrying insulin on the top of it one more injection temperature maintenance and uh, you know giving im injection all these are issues so dextrose is the simplest thing give uh, glucose uh, to eat immediately and follow it up will solve the problem in 90% of diabetic patients that's so how sir is we have been giving only this like 50% glucose i will push and uh, in, in the hospital DK, yes reflexly that is given that's okay in the hospital yes i am talking of minor hypoglycemia now we yes. have gone into yeah so yeah you are right once in the hospital if you have this facility yes go ahead glucagon uh, but glucagon also before you put the iv injection i mean you once you give the iv access then dextrose is the answer not glucagon be, okay. if you not able to get the iv access for some reason she is vomiting okay. and the vein is not easy then one shot of uh, i am glucagon will you know help us to tide for the to tide the time for 15 20 minutes before you get the access okay now coming to the other extreme diabetic ketoacidosis which is a, a real serious uh, a medical and an obstetric emergency even though it is a little rare but it can be fatal both for the mother and the baby it might lose the baby in up to 35% of the times and uh, it carries uh, it occurs at much low levels of uh, glycemia that's what the literature says much less than 250 generally teaching is it goes about 300 50 only we are supposed to meet Uh, we are supposed to encounter ketoacidosis in a non-pregnant individual. Here, in a pregnant lady with type one diabetes, they get into BK at much lower level. And uh, uh, what do you think, uh, Preet, should be the? Uh, they are more prone for developing BK uh, at uh, less than two fifty. Because of the increased resistance of insulin during the pregnancy, and at that. that Got that uh, respiratory alkalosis. Breathing high, breathing, which also decreases the ability to buffer the keto keto acids, and that is why it causes uh, diabetic ketoacidosis is more common in pregnancy. And uh, do you think we precipitate at times? Uh, BK, we can yes. possibly precipitate. Yeah, yeah, we can precipitate when we start giving the steroid injection for the fetal lung maturity. Sometimes, if they have the preterm labor, we give them the. Uh, We, we give them the beta myomatic tocolytics if they have any source of infection or symptomatic bacteria so we have to do the urine culture every trimester so any source of infection in the body can lead to can lead to the precipitation of diabetic ketoacidosis apart from that if they sometimes they, they, they may have even the they are they are taking inadequate insulin therapy which they can take and they will sometimes lead to They they will not realize that they have not taken the dose or missed the missed the dose or they have gone for a vigorous walking during pregnancy. If they go for nice walking, we tell them that you have to walk. So they start going walking. So all these uh, all these problems can lead to diabetic ketoacidosis for them. And especially, it may require an ICU admission. And if they have a diabetic ketoacidosis, there is more chances of having IUDs also, fetal demise also. So we have to be very, very careful about the diabetic ketoacidosis in pregnancy. So, Shri Ram sir, now we are going to we have uh, called yes, you for reference with the patient suspected DK. Treat, treat us, sir. Yeah, quick comment. Uh, in addition to what Dr. Preet Madam has said, uh, uh, obvious. See, yeah, normal pre pregnant lady also might have ketones positive if she has not taken food for prolonged periods of time. Fasting. especially urine ketone positivity is not at all rare starvation is also a mixed picture and on the top of it the demand of the fetus is high so the glucose will be i saw one of the slides you nicely put a normal pregnant lady will have usually lower sugars than a non pregnant normal person so the cut off in uh, the 63 is the hypoglycemia yeah, for, yeah, the normal pregnant lady also can go up to the level of 60 so it is the, for the for the reason cited the uh, the 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 alkalosis is also complicating they can have what is called u glycemic decay which is the sugar should be around 180 or 200 but they can so the ph will tell us lactate levels will tell us the clue and if repeatedly the glucoses are normal then you have to rule out starvation ketosis and in the first case of starvation also contributing to this you have to increase the carbohydrate intake rather than you know this thing in the dka you have to obviously admit the sugar should be high and uh, you will you will have more than 2 plus one simple clue is you rarely starvation ketosis will be more than 2 plus 
any urine ketone 2 plus or more or if you have the serum ketone availability if you can measure uh, in the patient is affording that is uh, in the western setups in highly in informed setups they carry keto sticks all type 1 diabetics should have both glucometer strips and this and one more problem in our setup see patients on insulin pump you know they will be falsely reassured that insulin is going on sometimes there will be a tube blockage temperature in india in the summer season can be very high and the insulin can go you know defunct so all these are also reasons for dk so it is better to be doubly careful sometimes is falsely reassuring modern technologies can you know slip your uh, feet uh, very badly sometimes so can you can you quickly uh, recall i mean make us recall what are iu fluid therapy for dk uh, ah yani young loads patient loads of iu fluids first that is standard dk treatment in pregnancy it is no different the first uh, is always iv saline you give at least 1 liter in the first hour and uh, it reassess the Uh, volume status and in the and not insulin insulin in us is not our first aim and as as the as the hypotension improves and the fluid status improves in the first two hours we monitor glucose we don't monitor ketones we monitor only glucose and ph in the next 2 to 4 hours any dka will recover in the first 8 hours if it is uncomplicated fortunately many of these are young ladies with uh, normal heart so there should not be any problem rushing them with fluids and maintaining output and uh, insulin as infusion will be continued till she regains full uh, you know uh, consciousness and eating normally i mean i will just to put in nutshell if you have any yes, yes. Oh. Yeah. 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 i think uh, i think madam preet uh, very nicely mentioned this Uh, dexamethasone the black lamethasone injection which you give sometimes in an uncontrolled diabetic can really hike up the sugar in the first two days uh, a couple of dk presentations have been reported uh, due to the steroid injection we have to be carefully monitoring the steroid hello sorry we are not hearing i think on the video the problem so uh, even cardiovascular system can be carried but most of the patients need okay so first issues no issues but then if they are a little on the older side uh, then uh, the problem really becomes a big one and uh, the guidelines says you do a ecg for females about 35 only but we have started doing ecg and echo for all our pregnant mothers before 28 weeks sometimes at booking and especially for type 1 diabetes uh, shira sir would you like to do ecg and echo at booking or will we wait till 28 uh, days during pregnancy unless there is symptoms beyond your uh, explanations which can be given due to the gestational period uh, we usually don't give or pre gestationally if there are uh, some clues as i said uh, they are usually in their late 20s or early 30s and uh, type 1 diabetic if for more than 10 years or 15 years maybe we have to think about doing this otherwise less than 10 years you can seriously think whether we need to really do that's what practically we follow we don't do echo as per the either. tamil nadu government guidelines since the government colleges have started doing ecg and echo for every pregnant lady respect to the background we also started following it and uh, i'm just asking for the guidelines says you do it only after 35 years more than 35 or put it also in the age of diabetes in the sense uh, okay. if the diabetes duration is more than 15 20 years you do less than 10 years rarely they'll have a problem okay so how do you think uh, breathe will this uh, neuropathy manifest in a pregnant lady type 1 diabetes and this yeah, yeah, neuropathy that, uh, will we... have any first uh, sir you want to answer that hmm. no 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 sorry i thought uh, that's okay that's okay please carry on neuropathy mainly in case of pregnancy there will be increase uh, uh, vomiting in pregnancy in first trimester so that first trimester is related to the gastroparesis and as sir told that the hypoglycemia attacks initially they will know that they have hypoglycemia but if they have repeated hypoglycemia they are unaware of the hypoglycemia because of the autonomic neuropathy associated with it and they have the hypoglycemia and they also have the orthostatic hypotension So all these led to a 
case of a peripheral and autonomic neuropathy in pregnancy because of of the type one diabetes. And thus, what happens? Maybe they may require more of anti-emetic, and they may require more of hospitalization. They may require parental nutrition many times for this neuropathy to be tackled during pregnancy. So, what are the key complications that you can? Doctor Deepthi has already told us, and even uh, Doctor Harishita told the HPA1C is very very important pre-gestational type, and if it, if it are the chances of getting congenital anomalies doubles up, quadruples up, depending upon the periconceptional hyperglycemia, and majority as we know is cardiovascular. Of which the most important is the transition. Uh, transition and the BSD, and of course followed by the uh, the CNS, of which we know the all the urinary uh, defects. But if you get a caudal regression syndrome, which I am yet to see. The, the, the risk is that, that there is 80% chance that the mother will be a diabetic. So there will be other, other, uh, other common uh, GI anomalies and even you will have the urinary tract anomalies. So, but apart from that, the most important and most common is the cardiovascular anomaly. So what do you think should be the pathogenesis in this type of MA, they, this is because of the, the genes involved in signaling the metabolic pathways. So that is that is during the normal embryonic development. Then this these obese lady with BMI more than 30, 35, they are even if they don't have a family history, even the sugars are well controlled, they can still get some sort of anomalies associated with. So, yeah, last week also we had one patient, we were wondering why she got the, uh, why, why she got the, the anomaly, where there was no other risk factors and we found that the Dana ma'am. Dana ma'am, we were not able to hear you, ma'am. Are you able to hear us? Yes, ma'am. Now, now it's audible. Uh, Rajshree, are you able to hear us? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are in the open. There's a single problem there. Of course, we know the... Sweaty complications can be early pregnancy, like our patient, you're running hard, and they can develop. Nanamma, Maggie, you're gone. We're not able to hear you clearly. And polyadrenals, which itself can lead to um, preterm labor, and they have increased. Um, classic, like you have uh, hypothermia, erythrocytosis, and respiratory distress. And some signal problem is happening here because we are in the hospital, ma'am. We couldn't go home. Hello? Hello? Manuel, let us... Uh... Yes? Are you able to hear us now? Better? Yeah. Yeah. Beginning, yes, ma'am. In the beginning, we are able uh, to hear. We'll continue. We'll continue. 
Pardon? Yeah, yeah. Are you able to hear now? Yes. Yeah, go through the next slide quickly, Dan. Sayiti. Yes, ma'am. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Yeah. yeah. We already talked about the subject of conflict. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. The neonatal complication is also over. Next slide, please. Now about the antenatal care. Now we'll uh, start off. Uh, all the spokes in this giant wheel are very, very important to have a successful outcome of this pregnancy. We'll uh, go through one after the other. Uh, let us first take up uh, weight gain. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Sriram, sir, what do you think uh, should be the ideal weight gain for a pregnant lady with type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes, usually if she is, baseline weight is if she is lean, the, most of them are uncontrolled and lean. So I think uh, they should gain weight appropriately for what they are starting with. Uh, so the usual recommendation by an, in a, in a non-diabetic lady will be the same recommendation if she is lean. Only problem in type 2, you will have a lot of issues. Already OBS, PCOS, and uh, you know there, there will be an issue. Here, I am not much concerned if she is starting with an underweight or a low weight. As, but as put here, I think that is the logical answer for the question. Though I don't want to read out the numbers. Now, we'll, uh, first time, we'll invite uh, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, into our, in, growing uh, child, in growing child and in pregnancy, the idea of diabetes management is give adequate nutrition and give insulin so that they you know they, they get the anabolic effect of insulin rather than uh, you know it's not like starving and keeping sugars falsely normal that's not that should not be i think this should be driven in when they come for this i, I would like okay. to hear from other okay well, now hyperglycemia is better than hypoglycemia yeah yeah and uh, let us first, uh, first of all, invite uh, Dr. Meenakshi into our uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Meenakshi Bajaj, are you with us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, now, uh, let us talk about nutrition. And nutrition means Dr. Meenakshi. Please, uh, uh, you can with go ahead and whatever ideas you have. With reference to type 1. Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can go ahead. Yeah. With reference to type 1 diabetes, I very well agree with Dr. Sriram sir, what he just made a mention that if the BMI is on the lower side, but if, when we look at the IOM guidelines, it talks like gaining 18 kgs of weight for a BMI of less than 18.5. If we go to the previous to the previous slide, the IOM 2009 guidelines, as sir said, most of the type 1 girls are uh, almost, you know, less than 18 or just 18 BMI. So we are looking at a weight gain up to 18 kgs is way alarming because every kg includes about 7,000 kilocalories. If you consume 7,000 calories, you will gain one kg of weight. So we need to be, we need to revisit the IOM guidelines. That is the first point. And second thing is with reference to type one, whatever their calories they were consuming pre-pregnancy. Suppose they were consuming 35 kilocalories per kg, ideal body weight. They continue the same in the first trimester. Second and third trimester, we add another 340 and another 452 calories. So that's how it goes totally with reference to uh, type 1 diabetes. And uh, protein requirement is definitely on the higher side with reference when you compare it with the type 2. So usually the type 1 young girl walking into pregnancy, 1.2 grams is a usual requirement pre-pregnancy. So we may continue maybe for the first trimester with 1.2, but gradually you need to step it up to 1.5. But whenever we step up the protein, remember it should be plant-based protein. Definitely that improves gut dysbiosis and keeps the insulin resistance on the low. Though we know type 1 is not associated majorly with insulin resistance. But as the pregnancy is progressing, we do not want her to absolutely gain only fat. So we need muscle mass alongside and we need the protein to be preferably plant-based protein. And how much protein? Usually ADA recommends 71 grams throughout the entire pregnancy. If it's too big a number to understand, whatever is their baseline protein consumption, you add another at least 10 to 15 grams, at least 10 to 15 grams, which means, you know, if as with reference to egg, I would usually suggest egg whites. Even if she has been a type one, I would still go with egg whites. And the second thing is whole grams, nothing like whole grams because they are lente carbs. And if you talk of the South Indian population, that's a source of iron, folic acid, protein, 
all of it and it's a lente carb so we need the protein coming majorly from lente carbohydrates they are the whole grams the oats the barley but not like porridges so that's important and third important thing is you need to follow something called a food order since we want the postprandial good control we want first the vegetables or the fiber walking in followed by the protein protein could be the dal could be the kurta could be the sambar could be the raita could be the egg whites egg white is the only option which i suggest even if you are a non vegetarian followed by then the cereal portion cereal i mean by rice or chapatis so then along with rice and chapati again we choose on the vegetables as well as the dal or the rasam or the curd whatever in type ones usually i do not see the role of split meal plan therapy usually in the pwds that is persons with type 2 diabetes i see the role of split meal plan therapy because with type ones we work with daphne with the dose adjusted for normal eating so they are used to insulin maybe the requirement is slightly on the higher side for breakfast but i usually don't go with split meal plan therapy unless i'm regularly following up the patient who is on insulin those who are not on insulin is totally different but all our type ones are on insulin so that's not a worry another important thing is whether she's a type 1 or a type 2 i keep her away from saturated fat because the more she's exposed to too much of saturated fat maternal triglycerides are going to raise which in turn is a you know direct relationship to macrosomia so that's one important component to be kept in mind and uh, as sir already mentioned that there is a risk of hyperemesis gravidum there is a risk of ketones ketones positive so starvation ketones minimum 175 grams so we like it or we don't like it at least 700 calories should come from carbohydrate obviously the type of carbohydrate should be the complex carbs that goes without saying fruits never along with the meal never ever along with the meal it's always in between the meal and usually we suggest evening and bedtime to prevent nocturnal hypoglycemia that's very important and type of insulin she is taking we need to uh, you know match the diet timing along with the type of insulin she is on so hypoglycemia is another very important component i think sir made an equally important emphasis but my usual target is i tell them glucose i don't tell them sugar i say if you don't have glucose then go for sugar and i never ever tell them take a fruit juice or a milk with sugar because if they are going into moderate or severe hypoglycemia and as sir said hypoglycemic unawareness is very common in type 1s the girl may have a pulmonary aspiration so usually i never suggest drinks i always suggest them to take it sublingually even the glucose if they can take it sublingually the absorption is much better so and uh, as ma'am made a mention of gastroparesis and peripheral neuropathy i would never take the first call with parental nutrition so always you can choose on a glycemic friendly formula or if not a glycemic friendly formula the polymeric formula providing at least 50 grams you know every fourth to sixth hourly with adequate insulin coverage so that she doesn't go into starvation ketosis the last bet will be parental nutrition because parental nutrition by per se itself has a host of problems now when it comes to calcium vitamin c e and all of it we follow the rda which is now recently again revised in july 20 in september 2023 we had a revision from icmr so we need to follow with them and there the iron requirement is very low it's about 27 mg i can't understand why is it so low as 27 mg so i have written to nin to look into it and tell us what is the reason why it should be 27 mg you know in a pregnant mother versus a non pregnant mother where the iron requirement is much higher i don't know there seems to be some confusion in the numbers so with reference to folic acid is usually 570 micrograms and calcium is 1000 mg so each one of them have their own target but as sir made a mention on celiac disease we need to be very very careful with nutritional deficiencies it could be the vitamin a vitamin d calcium magnesium zinc selenium a lot of deficiencies protein could be a lot of deficiencies and then the challenge is we are not giving them gluten we are not giving them oats barley or wheat so we are going to give millets in millets which millet that's important yes sir and um, just comment on this uh, dha also as you are mentioning okay yeah so if with reference to ga dha i would say we would go with whole grams and green leafy vegetables that that's the better source no flax seeds no flax seeds because no flax seed oregano hemp and all of them because they're inadequately studied during gestational diabetes but recently there was a prebiotic fiber which has been launched and that's the beauty of it is it has been studied in pregnant women so that's wonderful if you can can manage our gut dysbiosis and it will also keep our blood sugars levels well postprandial peak will not be there so we can think of this prebiotic fiber also pre meal if they can take it fine if they cannot take it then it has to be only the sundal variety 
or the raita or something like that, which will prevent the postprandial peak. Another important thing is nuts. When we talk of nuts, they have to be soaked. That's very, very, very important. It has to be either the almonds or the walnuts. Carb counting is zero with almonds, but obviously one exchange, say about 10 to 12 almonds. You know, the bioavailability of protein, zinc, they are much more bioavailable. Walnuts also a great source of omega-3. I would say omega-3 comes from green leafy vegetables. So the murung kira is the best kira, I would say, when it comes to South India. You know, it's bountiful in all micronutrients. Next comes the whole grams and no flax seeds. And the vendium goes as usual only, nothing special. We don't want to try anything special here because as I mentioned to you, it's not been studied well enough yet in gestational diabetic mothers, the role of adjunct therapies. So about juices, only when they're having hyperemesis gravidum, not otherwise. Fruits, always the apple, guava, sweet lime, orange, they are always on the lower on the GI and the GL. And as I mentioned to you, never along with the meal. And if they can take an ambla, one ambla, not in the form of a pickle or a juice or sugar soaked or something like that. Simple one, one nellika, add it to the chutney or just grind it and take a shot of almond, of amla, just like that. For the vitamin C, I think it does wonders for gestational diabetic mothers. That's one important thing. And obviously no skipping meals. Hypoglycemia is important, as equally important as hyperglycemia. And uh, in type two, we have a lot of, nitty gritties when compared to type 1. Type 1, we don't trouble them too hard, except that there is no hyper, there is no hypo, and they're gaining adequate weight, we are more than happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meenakshi. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Preet, do you, what do you think about the physical activity? How uh, how best it can help a type 1 diabetes? Physical activity is also equally important in all diabetes, whether it is type 1 or type 2. And the exercise, walking is the best form of exercise. So when you go for regular walking, the hypoglycemia, yes. the, the, there will be more of, uh, the, there'll be more of, uh, what do you call, uh, the uh, chances of getting uh, into the gl glucose control will be there. But always remember if the physical activity is more, then you have to be very particular about the hypoglycemia, which can be induced. So the patient initially, when she starts going for good, with brisk exercise and walking, we have to tell her that she should eat something prior to going for the exercise. And uh, she, she should not start some anything new in the new suddenly, and uh, which she had done in the pre-pregnancy state. And she should continue the same thing which she was doing before, especially in the first trimester. And upper body ergometric exercises are also very good. Yeah. Now coming to the glucose monitoring, uh, that is very, very vital during uh, pregnancy for a type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Uh, Dr. Sriram, sir, uh, what will be the target? Next slide, please. Saiti. The target, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, I think I'm audible. Yeah. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Saiti, next slide, please. This is a consensus arrived at by various studies. The sanctity of this is that we have followed it for quite some time. And please remember, everything has a range. So this has been clearly mentioned here. Yeah. At least 70 to 80% of the values checked over a period of time should fall into these numbers. It is okay. not possible to have every number within this range. This is the common problem we face. If I ask and that to a type 1 diabetic, she has to prick at least minimum is 3 to 4 times. Minimum. In a resource constraint yeah. setting, that is also a problem. And if they are on CGMS, and I'm more worried about hypo and that real fluctuations, which go above the 200 centimeters. So even in a CGMS patient in India, with uh, sweating and other things and you know misplacement of the um, uh, sensor, so there could be a problem. We should always check for it. CGMS is costly. So this one hour value of around 140 to in the, this around uh, two hours, around 120 is the usual number we have. And please, uh, my request to all the practicing uh, our OG colleagues is to, you know, have a fair averaged out value rather than being every number being within the range. And other things we calculate, you know, post meal also, see the post meal surge, even though in the US and other places, they insist on pre meal, the pre meal cutoffs are as uh, straightforward as fasting. That's the same cutoff as somewhere around 70 to 90. And uh, here, in post meal, one hour and two hour use is what we follow at least uh, four times a day. 140 and 120 for the first hour and two hour value. Please remember the glucometer, the usage should be 
uh, clearly talk to the patient, clear one drop, uh, the first drop not check, not squeeze, and the glucometer value should be uh, calibrated for the plasma glucose. Otherwise, you have to be careful. So these, you should know which glucometer. All the modern last five years brands will have the same kind of glucometer. We will not have a problem. If you have one odd patient, then you'll have a problem. Please check which glucometer are they using and, and if they will be in millimoles and you get confused. So all these are common uh, you know, day-to-day -day problems we face. And uh, hypoglycemia, if the yeah, yeah, early morning sugar, based on which we adjust the insulin. In this respect, uh, I don't know whether you have slides on types of insulin at all. Uh, yes, maybe. sir. Yes, sir. We have, sir. Okay. We, we uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Quickly, uh, Sahiti, please move with the discussion. Of course, just CGMS to, is wonderful. Uh, Continuous. One practical point uh, to be told to this audience is continuous glucose monitoring cannot be done throughout the pregnancy. You know, in our setup, it's too costly for having always. There are some type 1s who I faced recently. Uh, by the way, I want to share that during our training in late 90s and the early 2000s, we never saw a type 1 girl coming for pregnancy at all. We always saw de devastated patients. Now, in the last 10 years, I'm so happy. Every year, we are, we are managing at least 5 to 10 uh, type 1 diabetics with all first pregnancy, second pregnancy, etc. I'm so happy here. Because that time, the, the, the poor control of type 1 girls, they will be really malnourished by the age of 15, 20 with CKD and other things, all other problems by 20. The data from All India Institute and others will really put you depressed from all these benefits. The interesting point I wanted to mention here is continue the insulin which they are comfortable with. You can give it in the abdomen. And the routine insulins like uh, the were regular insulins, you know, in today's world, uh, it, it will have a lot of uh, problems in controlling. So go for the analogs if they are affording and the long-acting insulin. Always basal bolus. There is no question of mixed insulins in type 1 diabetes. Always basal bolus and try to adjust based on the values. Ah, CGMS in our setup, we use to adjust the insulin rather than checking control and day-to-day -day adjustment. Very few type 1s are so well geared up for that. If they are, you continue with that. So the calculation and answer, sir, I think we are. Do we have time for all this? You have type two also. No, no, we don't have. No, we don't have time, sir. So the point for units per kg is the usual dose, two thirds in the as you know basal and one third as uh, boluses. I mean, this you will easily get it if you practice for uh, the first few weeks in uh, diabetology. I, I, if there are any specific questions, I'll answer. Otherwise, don't want to oh, read okay, out. Sir. So first time is here, the oh, glycemic the management. Slide. Everybody should be on basal bolus. Don't try to manage with a mixed insulin morning, evening. That doesn't work at all. Three times a day minimum preprandial. If, if necessary, a fourth one for the snack. And a long-acting insulin to cover the intraprandial glucose. This will be the only regime. Basal bolus or multiple daily injection. Whatever name, both are same. Multiple daily in injection dosing and basal bolus are the only ways you will manage type 1 diabetes. As well as many of the type 2s who are uncontrolled. You, that is the only best way. Yes, pump I have already mentioned. Affordability. If you have a patient on pump, best is to continue it. They will already know to play around with it. You need to you need to, you know, go along with the flow. But I am sorry that in the hospitals where I work, the sisters and others, when they get admitted for the perioperative, I'm sorry, the peri labor management, they are not well versed with all this. We have a lot of problems there. So then we switch off the pump and go back to the usual multiple daily insulin and manage them. That is what we do. In That is a practical answer. You can't train every sister today who have been doing obstetric gynecology for so many years without pump. Suddenly, they'll become pump savvy. It doesn't happen that way. So, we need to always have a backup. And please remember in uh, in insulin, in our setup, the pump, if they are in uh, indoors, if they are working in IT, where they are in uh, temperature below 28 degrees, you can use pump. If they are outdoors and going for more than 2-3 hours, pump, there will be an issue with the temperature and the viability of the insulin. We should always remember this. And uh, insulin adjustment is always an art of uh, medicine, which I think has to be tailored for every patient. Don't go by the numbers alone. Yeah. Uh, can, uh, I think the, uh, the all the trimesters can be managed as per the uh, uh, guidelines. Yeah. But uh, one, one, put word, a, in, uh, one important word of uh, you know uh, what what uh, uh, shall I say? Uh, we should rededicate ourselves for pre-pregnancy counseling. That's most important in type one. I'm gonna first trimester la panandu varathla vandite. Then I will just you know jump into all yeah, this. Yeah, that's what. This whole. So we started with the pre-pregnancy counseling and then we went yeah, to yeah. pregnancy. 
So at yeah. least, I mean, I, let me be very practical. Even though the numbers will be less than six, less than six point five, at least let us have less than seven in our setup before they go for this eight and nine and you know, and there will be a lot of confusion, miscommunication. They'll read the you know, suddenly my well, my baby get affected. So let there be a very good control before pregnancy. But if they come with pregnancy, then all these discussions which you are doing will take off. Uh, my one more small comment on uh, that uh, vitamins and things which Madam also mentioned is. I uh, even see very nicely, you see this 5 milligram folic acid is always a uh, controversy. I don't know why we are overdosing our uh, hyperfolatemia, we are introducing it. Immediately. And second one is this B12. B12 is very, very commonly deficient here. Please give along with B12. In type 2, we are using metformin also. Some of our type 1s also are on metformin. It induces B12 deficiency. Be very careful. A multivitamin containing a good dose of B12 is really in order in our setup rather than just giving folic acid to our patients. All the more, if they are vegan, the trouble becomes even more, sir. Okay, yeah, uh, that uh, we'll have another. It is not. So we'll stick the trimester. Test. We'll go to the labor straight away. Saiti, can you move the slides faster because it is uh, almost. Uh, we are going beyond schedule. Yeah. Of course, uh, uh, diabetes per se is not a, a, a cause for uh, having these anomalies. But I would want to make a mention here. All these pregnant mothers, they love eating dates. And dates are never a source of iron. And their glycemic index varies from as low as 42 to as high as yeah. 75. Um, and stop, they are all stop. sugar syrup. So, Absolutely. So, Madam, uh, inner, never dates. Inner, inner, inner problem we face is if they eat, eat dates and don't wash their hands properly and check with the glucometer. And check their blood glucose, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's also we get. That is true. So now coming to delivery, uh, uh, after the trimesters are well managed, we we know the importance of going for uh, um, timely ultrasound as Deepti had already discussed. So we just skipped all that. And um, uh, when will you want to deliver a patient without macrosomia? Without macrosomia, I think we can wait up to 39 because these babies have got uh, delayed uh, delayed lung mature because the type 2 pneumocytes are delayed in secretion because of the high fetal insulin which enhances the cell, cell hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So well controlled 39 but we really go to that because sometimes the type 1 will be associated with having a lot of the other nephropathies and other preeclampsia and other things where we may have to deliver them earlier by 36 weeks also. So uncontrolled diabetes we have to deliver earlier. Otherwise, uh, well controlled, we can deliver up to 39 weeks. And uh, most of the time, the delivery route is vaginal delivery route. Unless it is any indication like macrosomia is there, more than 4 kgs and all, then only we go for a direct cesarean section. As far as possible, we should avoid the AVD, uh, uh, assisted vaginal delivery, because always associated diabetes per se is associated with shoulder dystocia and vacuum and forceps increases the chances of getting more of uh, shoulder dystocia. And of course, any anybody with previous LSCS, we do not allow them for a normal delivery. TOLAC is contraindicated. And uh, uh, we have to anticipate the prolonged uh, second stage of labor in uh, type 1 diabetes. You can anticipate shorter dystocia. And uh, of course, uh, the glycemic control, as Dr. Sriram said, the glycemic control becomes very, very important because the last six hours before delivery uh, determines where the, what the baby is going to face in the uh, immediate neonatal period because the six hours control is uh, very very important very crucial and uh, so we have to monitor the sugars depending on where, what type of insulin they are getting okay and if they are already on insulin then do it every hour if they are not on insulin if they are starving then uh, do it every four hours and uh, you have to match the uh, insulin according to the sugar level which you got from capillary blood glucose our target during the entire delivery period should be between 70 and 125 milligram per deciliter and uh, the increased, uh, if it is not well controlled, we can now pin it asphyxia, which is uh, for increasing uh, trend. And uh, when it is coupled with the not so con well controlled the third trimester readings, uh, then uh, the patient uh, will have uh, intrapartum fetal hypoxia and acidemia. So the importance of intrapartum uh, glucose control is very, very important. You should not skip basal insulin. That is a must. Okay, so additional insulin will be given depending on whether she's uh, uh, food restricted or not food restricted, whether she's in active labor, latent phase and all that. 
and uh, so once she is delivered uh, we should remember that uh, the postpartum uh, insulin requirement drastically falls down so make sure that you give the correct dose of insulin in the postpartum period as well and uh, even if you are taking this patient for a cesarean section the basal insulin should be given as 50 to 70% of what she had taken in the recent past and uh, induction of labor you can manage as uh, usual and uh, the glycemic target should be relaxed in the postpartum period and uh, you should uh, be aware that uh, neonatal hypoglycemia is only transient and neurological sequelae do not occur and uh, that easily but uh, nhu admission may be required just for uh, observation and uh, 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 I think I, we have taken a little extra time. Sorry, uh, this one, uh, Rajeshri, you can go ahead with the uh, quick uh, review. As uh, Dr. Uh, Sriram said, we keep on hearing the same thing again and again. Uh, certain important points will get into our head. I know you, your slides also will be repeating most of what uh, Dr. Sriram and Dr. Meenakshi Bajaj had uh, reflected on uh, nutrition and insulin requirement and glucose monitoring. But we'll quickly go through your slides. Ma'am, you are on mute. Kindly unmute. Ma'am? Yes. I have unmuted? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. 26 year old. She is a known case of PCOS with irregular menstrual cycle. She's married for four years. Conceived after ovulation induction with letrozol at a nearby fertility center. So when she went for the fertility treatment, her fasting blood sugar was 130 and two hours was 200 milligrams, that's type 2. And she was placed on metformin, 850 milligram twice daily and folic acid. She is now eight weeks pregnant and she has come to us with an ultrasound report of viable intrauterine gestation corresponding to eight weeks for further care. So her pre-pregnancy sugars were fasting 92, 2 hours 118 and HbA1c 5.9. Height is 150, her BMI is 32 and her blood pressure is normal. So her booking BMI is 32. So what would we do for the recommended weight gain? I think we have already gone through this. Uh, according to the Asian BMI, uh, more than 25 uh, comes under class 1 and more than 30 comes under class 2. So that should be accordingly. The weight gain needs to be managed. And now I will ask uh, Meenakshi, what MNT would you recommend for appropriate weight gain and glycemic control in her? Meenakshi? Yeah, the first thing would be uh, her weight gain should not cross 5 to 9 kgs in the entire pregnancy. With reference to our first trimester, it should not cross 0.5 to 2 kgs. So I would say 2 kgs in the first trimester, second trimester 3, and the last trimester another 3. So we've almost reached up to 9 kgs. That is fair to good. So 5 to 9 kgs is our target throughout the pregnancy. That is the first thing. Now what is calories? Now remember that we cannot go very, very low in calories, though she is considered as obese. But we have the ADA guidelines. We have the IDF guidelines, all of them telling us we should not go less than 25 kilocalories per kg present body weight. So usually as she's walked in in her first trimester, we will probably restrict her calories to pre-pregnancy calories. Whatever her pre-pregnancy calories was, mostly with her BMI of 32, she would be approximately 20 calories per kg IBW. That would have been her usual calorie intake pre-pregnancy. So we'll go with the pre-pregnancy calories approximately not less than 1,500. I'm reiterating that. The reason being, we need to give her at least 700 calories from 175 grams of protein. That is her first trimester. A second trimester and third trimester, we step up the calories to 1,006 and the last trimester could be up to 1,850. So that's her entire calorie requirement. Protein requirement immaterial of her trimester, it will go 71 grams throughout her pregnancy. Now, what about the fiber? It's about 28 grams. Now, how do we calculate this calories, not everybody has a calorie calculator, right? So it's easy to understand that we need to go at least six serial exchanges. Six serial exchanges. These Each exchange will give me approximately 17 to 21 grams of carbohydrate. So I say 120 grams is coming from serial exchange, which means the idli, dosa, upma, chapati. If I say idli, dosa, chapati, it is one exchange. Or if it is upma or rice, it is half cup cooked. So that's the exchange which I will keep in mind. So six exchanges of that. 
three cups of dal and sundal put together. So either I take it as a dal or as a kutu or as a sundal or as a sundal kolambu. That is the second thing. Third thing I choose with skimmed milk. We like it or we don't. We don't want the saturated going more than 7%. If I'll go with skimmed milk. Now I don't need to specially buy skimmed milk. I will buy regular our oven blue color packet milk, boil it, cool it overnight in the fridge, remove the layer of cream and I get skimmed milk. Now skimmed milk will raise the glycemic index of the drink per se. Though it has got whey protein, so I will just roast some almonds, powder it and add it to it or take some soap, almonds, consume it prior to my consumption of milk. If I'm not taking it as milk, I'm taking it as curd, I make it like a raita. I add some onion, tomato, capsicum, whatever I feel like and make it as a raita. Now, most important thing is since she was overweight and obese, it is possible that she was following some keto diet, something like that. For heaven's sake, no keto diet. This is no time for weight reduction. This is time for, you know, maternal fetal, you know, good outcome and good weight gain. Not overweight gain, but appropriate and ideal weight gain. Now, next important thing is sodium. Now, sodium, I don't want to give urka aplam vattal molagapuri. Because I may expect because she's overweight, she can walk into pregnancy-induced hypertension or whatever. So, I just keep the salt on the usual, no adding extra salt to thair sadam, to the buttermilk. No adding soda to the sundal. No adding uh, salt while preparing the uh, chapati ka atta or unnecessary soda in any form. In any other preparations, preserved, cooked or canned foods. So it is needless to say, it needs to be at least 2.5 liters per day. So to keep her away from any of the urinary tract infections. And as mentioned already by Sri Ram sir, we usually rule out B12 deficiency and she's on metformin. So all the more... She's at risk of B12 deficiency to prevent a small, thin, fat infant. So B12 deficiency is ruled out. Only then folic acid is supplemented or we correct both together. So that is about it. And with reference to carbohydrate, as I mentioned to you, there are several guidelines. One of the guidelines tells us we need to go as low as 45% carbs. Believe me, what India eats has been published by Indian Council of Medical Research in 2020. It says Indian population, urban or rural, consume a minimum of 73% carbohydrate. So these numbers sound very fancy and very nice in our guidelines. But believe me, it has to be ATP. When I say ATP, it has to be based on assessment. It should be tailor-made. It should be practical. All the three put together. So for that sake, our Indian guidelines tell us between 50 to 60% of carbs. That's what the Ministry of Health has suggested with reference to alongside with DIPSI guidelines. And we go protein 10 to 20%. So how do we go? The so ma'am has put a beautiful plate here. So in this plate, I would say that first the patient has to eat the tomato, onion and cucumber salad, followed by the parpa, then to the rice. Most importantly, the rice should be water strained. It should not be pressure cooked. And she should chew her rice very well. And the rice portion, probably I can reduce a little more and add one more sabzi to it or one more vegetable to it or a koot to it or a sundal to it so that there is more satiety towards it. And always, thankfully, my plate, ma'am, what she has put, my plate does not have a, it has a fruit, I'm sorry. It has a fruit. So remember, 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 never a fruit along with the meal. It's always mid-morning, evening or bedtime and most often once a day. Because we are looking at our BMI, I've told one fruit, three cereal exchanges, six cereal exchanges, three pulse exchanges. We cannot do without fat. So what type of fat do we choose? We can choose on rice bran oil refined. People are crazy with using check can now. No check can. Absolutely no check can. There are several reasons because of paucity of time. I won't be going to the details. But choose on refined oil and the best is rice bran oil. Keep changing the brand. You don't like rice bran oil. It's got a thick yellow color. You take carl liter null and carl liter refined oil. One for poriel, one for columbus. 500 ml oil per month per person. Great to go. No need to add extra dash of oil to your dosa and chapati. Let it be in the poriel, in the sambar and in the kuta or the kire. And remember, go as much as possible fresh. A sir was making a mention of DHA, wherein I've already made my comment on that. But with reference to fish, remember it should be freshwater fish, river water fish, lake water, pond fish. But usually if you can do without it, also good to go. I think our uh, vegetarian population in South India can manage greatly with the protein sources, providing a little bit of omega-3 also. It's, it's good to go with that. And uh, what else? The fruits, as I mentioned to you, the low GI ones are guava, and uh, sweet lime, oranges, they are good to go unless you're having gastritis. Another important thing is go with negative calorie vegetables like cabbage, cauliflower, radish, turnip, capsicum, brinjal, 
onion, all the gourd varieties, these are all negative calories. Greens are negative calories. So go away with the roots, basically the roots and tubers like potatoes. Sweet potato can be taken in the evening by squeezing some lime over it. So it behaves like a resistant starch. No kanji, kali, kool, no pongal puri barota, no appam, idiapam put, no yelaneer, no palan juice. These are important keywords and I usually tell them, you know, Mary Biscuits live like a family member in the houses of PWDs. No Mary Biscuits. It has to be only put to kadale or it can be almond soaked or walnut soaked, but not biscuits. Biscuits are not going to do great because the Maida has the streptozotocin along with the high GI, high GL. It also has streptozotocin, which can attack the pancreas and either, you know, worsen the diabetic uh, the status, the glycemic status very, very poorly. That's important. And uh, with reference to non-nutritive sweeteners, saccharin crosses the placenta. The safest is sucralose and stevia. But recently, we have had a lot of controversy talking about gut dysbiosis, CVD, stroke. So I would say just nine months, pull it through without any artificial sweetener. And absolutely no alcohol. It goes without saying zero alcohol. And if the patient is having gluten sensitivity, then it has to be uh, handled separately. Millets, we have only Gudravali, that is foxtail millet and barnyard millet. Gudravali and Tinai, these are the only two millets which are glycemic friendly. Never like a porridge, prepare it like an idli or a dosa. Because they are goitrogenic in nature, they need to be pre-processed, roasted, sprouted, fermented prior to preparation. And no bajra, no varag, because it is uh, definitely goitrogenic and our normal fermentation and soaking processes do not remove the goitrogenic properties unless they are malted for 48 hours. Though a lot of, uh, you know, uh, bajra is consumed, but we would say usually a no with reference to pregnancies. Thank you. Um, now she's eight weeks pregnant. Should we check her sugars again? I think we have gone through this. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sriram has already said that we have to maintain six, uh, not to exceed seven. How frequently would you do, would you do the A1C measurement, Dr. Sriram? First, first trimester we definitely do uh, and uh, second and third trimester see India is a population of iron deficiency also. Mm -hmm. Iron deficiency on one side will increase HbA1c. On the other side you have uh, the volume overload uh, because of pregnancy and that is diluting the thing and there is an increase in red cell mass. So it's a complex interplay between all this. So if you ask me practically, even though I also went through these guidelines in ADA and other things, yeah. it is not uh, cost effective and uh, reliable to do HbA1c in the second and third trimester. Don't confuse. Oh. Go by uh, you know sugar values. And today, yeah. if it's a type 1, uh, do CGM. If it is a type 2, uncontrolled, do a CGM. Controlled means no problem. Don't do HbA1c. Go by the point values and take care. Point. And don't get worried about HbA1c. Oh. So we have already seen at the target values. Is there any role for insulin and C-peptide level? Fasting insulin in, and C-peptide? In pregnancy, unless you are doing a research. No. Unless we are doing? Some research uh, study. Okay, Don't so there's no indication study. for any of these. No indication. You're not uh, going to change anything. Yeah. Ketonuria, I think we have already gone through it. So uh, we need to test only if it exceeds 200 milligrams. Yeah, in the urine routine, which you are supposed to do, I think, in follow-up, yeah. uh, maybe you should avoid ketone. And if the ketone is one plus or trace, don't get alarmed. Because, okay. uh, you know, just ask whether when did she eat last. Okay. And if she says more than uh, six to eight hours, see, even in six hours, she can develop ketones. In pregnancy and that two type two obese, she can have ketones as early as six to eight hours. Unlike 10 to 12 hours in a non-pregnant person. And uh, her fasting blood sugar is 104. Her two hours is 150. HbA1c is 6.130. HbA1c is 6.1. Can she continue the metformin or is there a need to start insulin? To put it very diplomatically, see, you follow your institute, uh, whatever guidelines. So if I, everybody is following differently and ultimately everybody can quote some guideline or the other. Yeah. My practical yeah. answer is insulin is the safest. Let us not get away from the fact. And what are you? There will be some controversy written by somebody on metformin, somebody on glipenclamides, acarbose. Everywhere there will be papers. So if you ask uh, in this patient, you know, fasting itself is going touching around 104, 120, yeah. which is all clear cut indications to start insulin in this patient. There is no doubt. So uh, how do we switch? How do we switch off from metformin to insulin? 
Yeah, see, in many places today, because metformin is the only drug which has been studied in all uh, trimesters of pregnancy, and the safety is reasonable. And 500 milligram twice a day, or even up to one gram twice a day, if she is already on, she is a PCOS lady. There are yeah. some papers, so let her continue. She's on 850. She's on 850 BD. Oh, whatever. Oh, whatever that that. One gram, one gram BD is also tried in pregnancy, and. Uh, and somebody was mentioning about insulin crossing placenta and uh, one insulin doesn't cross etc the both metformin and glibenclamate crosses placenta in fact it is uh, the concentration in the fetal blood is same as the maternal blood so and it is a mitochondrial acting drug if you go into the animal studies etc there will be some controversy but overall it has helped 30 40 years of experience so let us not go into that uh, discussion if you are continuing continue in type 2 but in this patient insulin is definitely required i need to give you a good dose of night dose of uh, insulin so that the fasting comes under reasonable control because i am anticipating in the next uh, trimester it's going to go further high insulin resistance is going to go further high so i will be anticipating a, a bad uh, sugar values in the next few weeks so today you, maybe on the will you add insulin along with metformin or will you completely yeah. switch that is what practically we do that okay. is what practically we do and uh, if you are too strict with science you stop your uh, metformin and this thing. Sweet. practically many places both are continued that's the practical okay. answer okay. but the counseling for insulin should be done on day 1 when she confirmed for our uh, so how this do you use the type of insulin is there any specific criteria whether to use a mixed ad or a rapid and long acting yeah. combination this is this is in contrast to what i said for type 1 diabetes where there was only one answer it is easy to answer in type 1 here you have a combination here this kind of uh, Next card is anyway a brand name. Anyway, thirty seventy insulin with the NPH is a very good choice for this patient because you need a fasting control. You should give something in the night definitely for this patient. So I would go with a thirty seventy or a fifty fifty insulin twice a day to start with, and preferably a night dose also good. Rapid plus long acting very good. Multiple daily. That if you can if you can convince her straight away that's good. Or else I'll start with this two weeks. I'll monitor. She'll come back with some reasonable values. I'm okay with that. Otherwise, I will hike it up. Okay. See, don't go into too much of this. You know that all insulins are used in pregnancy, including the latest Deglu Death is now approved for in use. So let us not go into some papers which have come few years back. And that controversy is all analog insulins. If they are already on, they can continue. That means you can start. only thing is the long acting insulins will take more than 2 3 days for them to stabilize so you need to give time you cannot like nph you can't expect a result in the next 24 hours you should wait for 3 2 3 4 days so you will days. call her for review after 2 weeks sir yeah roughly yeah the, the, those are all logistics uh, okay. guideline says yes you okay. earlier if possible so that i know i can monitor the issue. Yeah, this is for Dr. Breeth, but this has already been discussed that you will have to evaluate for retinephropathy. You look for serum creatinine, urine protein to creatinine ratio. And uh, sorry, madam, one small point: this yes. retinopathy worsening with insulin should not be any reason to not start insulin. Please, that point should not be overstressed, and that is more common in type one, not in type two. Type two, anyway, you will screen, but insulin starting is independent of retinopathy. Let us not; uh, it will definitely improve in the long run. Retinopathy transient worsening is not a reason to, you know, not initiate insulin in any way. We have gone through this in type one, so about neuropathy and also about gastroparesis. So we at twelve weeks we do the routine ultrasound and aneuploidy screening. Now, uh, Dr. Preet, would you like to add on uh, low dose aspirin to her? Yes, ma'am, definitely, yes, ma'am, definitely. Okay, Not audible to prevent the preeclampsia, so it comes under uh, high risk. So we will start her on low dose aspirin now. So antenatal care in the second trimester, every two to four. Interestingly, yes. madam, interestingly, every diabetic patient in pregnancy, uh, PWD is the right word. I am sorry. So. Uh, you know the diabetes control helps in preventing hypertension and uh, preeclampsia that's also an important uh, evidence so, you know that that's association they all go, especially in type 2 diabetes they all go hand in hand so your diabetes control helps in reducing pih and preeclampsia reducing preeclampsia oh yeah. okay okay 
So antenatal visits every two to four weeks, close monitoring of BP weight gain and uh, echo and anomaly scan has already been discussed. Uh, this has also been told that she is more prone for uh, urinary infections. So once in each trimester, we need to check or do a urine culture. And antenatal exercises have been discussed in detail. And um, uh, Sriram said, this is what she's maintaining and she comes to it, uh, comes to us in the second trimester. This is what we ask them to maintain along with the meal and uh, the sugar values, one hour and two hour. Uh, so is there any need for pre-meal uh, sugar, sir? And, uh, no, no. You, you, that's what I've said. No, you follow one regime in your uh, hospital. If you are following pre-meal, the cutoff should be obviously 70 to 90 or less than 100, 95. So do, we, do we have to do a pre-meal also? Or, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I have been, uh, we have been practicing fasting and post use for the last Yeah, time. we have also been. Okay. I don't want to change that and uh, okay. suddenly yeah. follow ACOG guidelines on this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we do only the, we also do four times fasting and two hour monitoring because uh, macrosomia is increased yes. in the post yes. Yeah, post -meal. Again, there are some preferences in some hospital. They are doing one hour, some hospital two hours. It is from the first bite of the meal. Uh -huh. That is the time to be taken. You know, sometimes, you know, the serial value is more important than actually harping on one number, you know, going high and low with all the precautions. So see some seven, eight values and decide an average and take a mental picture biologically rather than being a mathematical teacher. Mathematics teacher may be correct. So, already ultrasound has been spoken, 28, 32, and 36. And uh, she's on ecosprin along with, she's on placed on rapid acting insulin and uh, uh, Detimar also, two units. And uh, she's progressing normally. So, antipartal fetal surveillance from when? Um, Preet, ma'am, do you want to take it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We should do it uh, after 32 weeks. We should be very vigilant especially regarding her sugar control and as well as the biophysical monitoring. We do it twice weekly, but uh, sometimes it is not possible to do twice weekly. So weekly once is also okay, especially after 36 weeks, ma'am. Uh, and if it is a complicated pregnancy with IUGR and all, then we have to start it very early and we have to be very, very careful and we have to do it even weekly. We have to do it also. Okay, twice weekly we have to do it. Because suddenly if the maternal condition or the status deteriorates, then there can be the insulin requirement reduces whenever it is there that can affect the baby. Now. So we have to be very vigilant at that time. So in our hospital, we will do it every week after 32, 30, 34 weeks. We start doing it every weekly now. Uh, Dr. Sriram, uh, the, there is that uh, increasing insulin requirement. What is the implication? We are worried when there is a fall in the insulin requirement. Oh, fall in requirement is uh, something different. Uh, I mean, obviously, usual checklist will include uh, suddenly becoming too conscious on diet and overwalking and no, no, not sir, eating. the last time the mm. And a technique of insulin injection, very, very important. Uh. Techniques, uh, commonly we find uh, too many problems. In spite of pregnancy, we suggest on the abdominal wall. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the upper abdomen. And uh, if at all she is too concerned, on the thigh, never in the arms. This is a general uh, dictum we follow. As I said, some of these will have some overlapping differences between institutes. But please uh, follow one thing uniformly in your place so that you have a way of finding it out. So uh, my answer for this will be usually the requirements will go higher and higher. Uh, again, especially when the fetus is rapidly growing from 28 weeks to 35 weeks. And she also eats more. So I expect actually a higher dose. Going down on insulin, you have to seriously think is she having some other comorbidity or I mean some other intercurrent illness which is interfering with my interpretation. Yes. Biological explanation is what a sudden fetal demise. I don't want to go into that rare possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Usually it is a common garden presentation. I expect a higher dose invariably as the pregnancy advances. Yeah, I think planning of delivery has already been dealt with. So, similar to yeah, so, uh, similar to type one. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Mode of delivery again. Uh, there are only certain indications: strong suspicion of macrosomia, severe preeclampsia, or severe fetal compromise. 
for the indications for cesarean section otherwise you could go for so uh, what are the intrapartum complications i think dana madam has put out all the intrapartum events and we'll counsel this lady came with uh, premature rupture of membranes which was augmented and she delivered back to assisted delivery uh, the postpartum complications have also been uh, do you want to uh, tell dr preet what will you expect postnatally i think madam has already postpartum and postnatal postpartum is for the mother or the baby for the mother for the most of the postpartum the sugars come back to normal ma'am that i have come back to normal yeah, yeah. and we, we can just stop the insulin the they can be she can have uh, more chances of lactation failure she can have uh, then the, the then the even the mentally she can be little bit uh, disturbed postpartum psychosis can also be more in her case ma'am uh dr shriram about the management uh, how to repeat yeah. after delivery and management of sugar after delivery since this patient was uh, uh, diabetic even before the pregnancy so it's not that difficult to counsel her that her diabetes will continue and uh, she has to be on uh, close follow up the close follow up in the sense you know in spite of telling this she'll be she'll be continuing to have even if she was only gdm also she is at higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes in the future usually we call them whenever they come for the uh, you know the babies uh, visit for uh, right? that will be easy for uh, travel so uh, at least in the first four weeks uh, weekly once continue her glucose uh, monitoring we don't want uh, too high as well one third of people will continue to require some insulin if the dosages were very high in the first uh, few weeks and uh, and uh, nutrition and other things suddenly ella nalla aichu kondha nalla porunduchu say suddenly start eating more and the commonest problem we face is that Uh, repeated counseling only will help us breastfeeding metformin, metformin yeah. is uh, indicated it's not uh, contraindicated in uh, breastfeeding ah. so ah. that's uh, that's uh, anyway it's all class b indication nothing is class a but all these are well indicated in uh, breastfeeding so you can give metformin continue metformin ah. so she has been referred for further care because at two weeks itself uh, fasting 126 and 2 hours was uh, 180 so immediate and lifelong follow up uh, annual fbs every 3 uh, months uh, every 3 months okay every 3 months i mean it will be a good reminder for her but usually they'll be in their mother's place they'll be you know the social things there'll be too many problems yeah. in all this it's not as yeah. easy as what we discussed retinal renal and other things we can wait that will okay. be uh, retina can be a year unless she had a retinopathy we don't need to worry now uh, okay. anyway our control will become better IGF one and other things will come down. Placenta is delivered, so there will be no problem. Adala yearly ones, but uh, yeah. sugar monitoring and uh, awareness about weight gain should be created repeatedly. So every three months for first year yeah. or uh, every three months? Yeah. Like, just like any other type two. See, there will be logistic issues. Be carrying an infant with her, so yes. let us uh, be practical. So contraceptive advice. I think you've already said no vascular complications. All methods. vascular complications then avoid combined hormonal contraceptives and report mpa and uh, yeah uh, when giving steroids uh, dr uh, shriram we have to be careful as what we said how do we adjust the dose should we do we need to admit her in case at the, we have to consider antenatal steroids if you are in a setup where you know patient is willing for admission you have the facility better admit that is an answer for our patients in our uh, ramchandra kind of setup very often we admit i am sure my og madams are that they will agree with me yes, uh, yes, but sir. in cutting uh, cutting setups oh, where yes, you yes, are yes, highly yes, educated yes, patient, yes, daily yes, monitoring yes, sugar yes, and this is where telemedicine can really help in some patients yes, where you know uh, you know they can uh, check correctly and give us the feedback you will require very high doses of insulin for those two days three days for example uh, 30 40% increase in insulin requirement will be there in the first uh, uh, that will happen 6 to 8 hours after the injection so technically if you give it in the that injection in the morning the sugar will start and you give another dose after 12 hours so anyway next to 48 hours there will be a rise in sugar so you have to cover all the doses and uh, as put the right in here and it will rapidly come down after the uh, dexamethasone effect goes Manage during labor. Uh, any particular frequent monitoring and uh, ready for IV insulin also. 
That's ready for IV insulin. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, thank you. Now that I is more into the anesthesia territory. If we should have had an <laughs> anesthesia. Oh, okay. monitoring. Okay. 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 Because they have their uh, small, you know, their practical difficulties. There will be too many yes. things, uh, lines going everywhere. They may not be worry about this sugar. And they might have to give dexamethasone for some other reason during uh, anesthesia. There will be many issues there. It's yes. a very dynamic situation. This one, uh, Kundavi, Dr. Kundavi has put, sometimes we see sugars going very low on insulin. How do we tighter? In the chat box. Yeah. Uh, oh. I mean, again, a checklist. Was there a dose problem? In the, in the, you know, the 40, M, 40 units per ml uh, syringe versus 100 units per ml you know, and the, and the mismatch, all these, and depending on your setup, uh, the checklist is always meal insulin mismatch. You you were over cautious on insulin, technique of insulin, absorption. And there were, were a few minutes passing, you know, then, you know, the patient should be every time told about, you know, the site of injection, doses, what needle. In the, too many brands, too many confusions. I'm sorry that uh, we are in a even though technology is advancing, we are into problems. Our patients, you know, the, the matching is not happening. The, the gearing up to learn all this. So, in one unit, follow the same thing so that at least we have some checklist. Thank you. Thank you, sir. But I really pity those uh, diabetic women who get, uh, want to get pregnant. Six pricks uh, per day and then uh, another three pricks for insulin. Uh, really, they have they are, um, Wow. They, are, they have more yeah, Four pricks are at least you know fasting with uh, three post so at least four. Yeah. But the yeah. insulin pricks you can't avoid. I'm sorry. That is, yeah. <laughs> that's why some of the statistics will really put them off. You know, when the first trimester lady comes with an HbA1c of eight, and you tell them that the forty percent chance of this eighty percent Admar is on I don't know how they will. That is, a, that is in this whole discussion, how much that lady. Is behaviorally and you know distressed due to this whole thing is something we many times overlook. Throw the literature, they are talking about uh, depression questionnaire. Yeah, like, uh, postpartum. Postpartum. Post postpartum questionnaire is very important, is what they say. All guidelines are giving us a lot of numbers. Let us be guideline directed, but guidelines are guidelines. Let uh, there will be some 10 20 percent variation, some cushioning, some uh, local tailoring you have to do. That's just my small size. Based on each patient. So we have had three good outcomes with 11, sir. Sir, Srinam, sir, we had uh, three good outcomes uh, with you uh, managing the pregnant mothers with 11 plus HbA1c. Amma, All three of them had good outcomes. Amma, amma, adha, those are, amma, I wanted to ask, I don't know, this forum, even though it will be controversial, I don't know, the time is too much, we are exceeding time too much, but I want to put this controversial question. Is there any guideline in any obstetrics guideline thing saying that if the HPLC is more than this, you advise discontinuing the pregnancy? Then we just Never. No, no, no termination. We tell them what the consequences. Or you leave the, or you leave the we decision. We tell them the consequences. We, Sorry, the, we, we tell them the consequences yeah. and leave the option to the couple. Ah, uh, the other one. The other one. We leave the ball in their court, sir. They have to decide. <laughs> if you counsel in such a way that they will decide to abort, we take the decision, sir. Uh, because I, in Cairo, yes, sir, yes, sir, we take the decision on their behalf, sir. Yeah. Seeing nah, the condition, right. but there is no sir, sir, depending on the age, depending on the ah. and whether they just have a small, uh, just a small comment in that note. You know, in thyroid, our guidelines are very clearly suggesting never advise discontinuing or you know aborting the pregnancy just for thyroid purpose. For example, even if the TSH is more than hundred. In the first time, if it happens spontaneously, that's different. So, but the guidelines are clear. But in spite of all the risks, I don't know why the guidelines are not putting their foot down and saying, you know, you control the sugar and continue pregnancy. Why need to abort? I don't know. This is my cho my choice. <laughs> <laughs> because of the okay anomalies that had already happened, like, sir. Happened eight to ten organogenesis. Presentation not ah. all anomalies can be found out. There will be something yeah. which will be. Yeah. 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 It will be too much on us, sir. Definitely. <laughs> <they'll come laughs> to Apart from occult anomalies, there are many other things. So. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. That's why. This behavioral problem nobody discusses, sir. This uh, um, uh, children exposed to high sugars in utero. They have definitely behavioral problems, and somebody should do a long term follow up ah. in Indian settings. Oh, yes. 
in the in the in this not just people were who were on metformin during pregnancy those children there are two three major studies ada guideline le adha patti comment panniranga all those metformin treated mothers their children are becoming very obese after the second and third year of life they are all but obese and they are very normal the same is for oh. nns if they are consuming nns during their uh, pregnancy they see that the infants at the age of 7 they are very very overweight and obese and they have a sweet tooth so there are some papers to add on to this comment i think this will be a ever fertile area for all research studies and other things i think you know always will be discussed <laughs> thank you thank, thank you so much sir for being thank with you. us thank, thank you sir thank i would thank you uh, thank you sir if we have done i would like to thank on behalf of uh, safe mother committee our uh, oxy president uh, dr jayarani kamraj and dr kundavi oxy secretary for giving us this opportunity i thank uh, all the speakers arishmita uh, deepthi you have all done a great job you have put the basics it was so clear all of your talks lucid and up to time and it was good and finally moderators dana madam thank you so much uh, our panelists preet madam shriram sir and uh, meenakshi meenakshi bajaj thank you so much thank you so much i mean i think uh, we have uh, answered almost all the questions as far as we had there are no more questions in the chat box and i will thank uh, shravya for the um, uh, mock that you have done beautifully and all the uh, uh, delegates who have been listening to us and who were responsible for keeping us going on and i would also like to thank uh, shield for the platform given to us thank you and so this is i think this is the first time a type for i mean uh, pgdm is being discussed uh, in our forum at least we now see pgdm and having uh, uh, the dancer and uh, meenakshi along with us really helped us and the girls who did before also gave us a good basics so that we didn't have to go too much on that the three girls who did first they also gave us some amount of basics so that it was easy 